Uh, Morena Tato. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's uh, ordinary meeting of the Kaipara District Council. Uh, and we've got a great gallery. So thank you for all our uh, visitors coming along this morning. I think it's really great that you're here. I'm wearing a mask because I'm not feeling well. So if I get close to any of you, you might get something from me. So that's why I'm wearing a mask is to hold the bugs inside. Uh, so but good morning, everyone, and welcome. And uh, for this morning's uh, council meeting, I'm going to open with a karakia in our normal fashion. Kia hora te marano, kia whakapapu pro namu te moana, hei ho rahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, araha atu, araha mai, tātou i a tātou katoa. Thank you. The, uh, at this point, we're calling for apologies for today's council council meeting and I believe Gavin Dawson we have an apology from Councillor Joyce Pucky. Uh, to be confirmed, Your Worship, yes. Yes, so she's not joined us at present but is absent and Councillor Vincent is joining us online uh, and all other councillors uh, are present today. So that's good. Thank you. I'd like to move that uh, the Apology for technical lateness, if you like, from Councillor Joyce Parkey be accepted. And I'm seeking a seconder there. Thank you, Councillor Wilson Collins. Is there any commentary? All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Again, carried. Thank you. Item number 1.3 for today the confirmation of the agenda. Uh, we've got a packed agenda, so I hope all our visitors are staying for the whole business of the day because it's going to be a ripper. Uh, and uh, the confirmation of the agenda as presented, uh, I'd like to uh, move the uh, agenda be confirmed and uh, seconded there. Councillor Kurnow, thank you. Is there any commentary? No commentary. Thank you for putting that to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. There's our agenda confirmed for today. Item number 1.4, conflicts of interest. Uh, elected members, are there any conflicts of interest uh, regarding any of the items on our agenda for today? No conflicts of interest. All right, thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're moving on now to our presentations for today. And the first of these uh, is a presentation from Alex Martin regarding the Three Waters Better Off package. And uh, the Three Waters, uh, of course, as we know, has been uh, rolling on for quite some time now. But looking forward, Alex, to your five minute presentation, following which there will be questions for clarification from you, uh, from the elected members. Uh, and then we'll move on to our next presentation. Right, so thank you, Alex. Good morning. Good morning. You, you can hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so I only have five minutes. So I've I've got a bit of a speech here that we did together, um, and hopefully that'll be um, as concise as we could make it. Uh, so I'm Alex Martin. I'm speaking on behalf of concerned citizens and residents regarding the three water proposal and specifically the water services entities bill and the better off package. During the council meeting on 4 May, the mayor stated that 100% of the feedback he received regarding the better off package was to get the money and spend it well. Following an OIA request, um, we had disclosure of one written comment which had in the subject line, three waters bribe and asked the mayor to take the money. I provided a copy of this to Gavin and I think you may have already received a copy of that for yourselves. A limited approval of taking the better off package motivated us to set up an, on, a simple online survey to obtain reactions from the community about the proposal. So this is both three waters and the better off package. The survey was shared on local websites and community pages and Gavin distributed copies of the results to you. We ran the survey for two weeks, starting Monday 6th of June, and we received 131 responses. 
127 of these were not in favour of taking the better off package. We'd like to bring to your attention the fact that just over 93% of respondents felt that there was no community consultation. And we find that this is an appalling state of affairs in a democratic society, particularly on such important issues. 85% of the survey takers were also concerned that 90% of the better off package will be paid in arrears. If the government appeals this legislation in the future, and COPRA has committed to projects relying on the funding, the ratepayers may find themselves with potentially more debt on the balance sheet than anticipated. A main issue, particularly for local government, is the significant reduction of their role. Nearly 88% of respondents strongly agreed that this was another step towards centralisation, which removes local control over key public assets and services. It would also result in a substantial loss of revenue for councils and loss of local jobs for council staff and contractors. These jobs are what keeps our communities going. Um, can we afford to lose these? They're just slowly killing rural New Zealand by setting everything into larger centres. Um, and just as an aside, the next step may well be that the, compl the complete centralisation of services and abandonment of local government altogether. Um, there's nothing in New Zealand legislation to prevent this from happening. The government claims that three waters will result in better value for money for ratepayers. Anyone who has looked at the convoluted four-tier -tier bureaucratic setup must realise that there will be an increase in administration cost for the scheme. Co-governments with EV in particular will also add a significant amount of costs to the overall bill. Then there's the actual forecast of costs for the work to be done. Government is anticipating that upgrading the water systems will amount to $51 billion. $51 billion. We need to know who were the consultants advising the government on this amount? Do we know where the funding will actually be sourced from? Are leaders going to take security over our public assets? And if New Zealand defaults on payments, will overseas entities potentially become the owners of our most precious commodity? You are representing Kairos community. From our small survey, the sentiments are pretty clear. New Zealanders do not want to transfer the local assets to central government. And despite government pushing ahead, we ask you to keep voicing our disagreement with the scheme. On behalf of your constituents, we ask you to protect high price assets for now and our future generations. And that was pretty much um, the main points we want to cover. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, your presentation was very clear. Uh, so elected members, are there questions for clarification? Councillor Vincent, question for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question is, um, did the survey include provision for people to indicate whether they were actually users of those three waters services or not? No, no. But it's actually another issue that I was thinking about. There are a huge number of privately owned water suppliers. So whether that's Rehutai or um, say in Kiri, 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 Kiri in irrigation. So there are all these scattered private providers which also would um, face significant challenges to meet the requirements under the Act. So that's just another layer, but no, we haven't included that in our um, survey. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock, question for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Alex, my question is 
Were there any learnings that you could offer council uh, should council choose to undertake a consultation on this matter itself? I think there would be a huge amount of feedback, particularly from the farming community as well. Um, so consultation is an absolute must because I, I have hardly met anyone who thinks there's a good thing about this whole proposal. I mean, council's not perfect. We we know that mistakes have been made and they will occur in the future. But government has constantly overplayed these issues, considering how many people are drinking water every day, um, the dangers or the the um, the bad things about the local schemes are, are really negligible. So yes, consultation would definitely get a lot of feedback. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification at this point? I, I have a question for you, uh, Alex, uh, thank, and thank you for your presentation. Um, the a question that I have is regarding the stated in your presentation here, you've stated that council has really very little agency in all of this work, it's a government proposal, not a proposal of the council. Have you taken your concerns to your local MP? Have you taken the concerns to central government in any way? Because the concern that we would have is that there is little that council can do here. Uh, so, have you taken the concerns to the people who are making the choices? We certainly have. So, there have been many people in the group that I represent or the people that I talk to who have lobbied both central government as well as MPs, um, communities, uh, community groups like Groundswell. But at the end of the day, it all you get is a thank you very much for your uh, comment email, um, and otherwise it pretty much just gets brushed aside. So that's where where this lack of consultation really comes in. Um, but yes, certainly we have done it. Um, we have done emails directly to central government, uh, but we just feel that there are a number of councils in New Zealand that have taken a really firm dance toward this, and we just feel that Kaipa could do the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Vincent, further question? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I just wonder, in that vein, in terms of the, the consultation process which you request, like the, there's two issues, aren't there? One is the um, appropriateness or desirability of the three waters program reforms as they are. And the other is whether or not the council should accept the $16 million bribe. Correct? You said it, not me. No, well, I'm, I, I've said it before and it's on record. So I've got no problem in sta stating that. And um, I, the, but do you see any merit in the council undertaking a consultation process with the community on saying, do you support the three waters reforms or not? I think the council's on record that it doesn't. So what purpose would that serve? I think the consultation needs to come from the ground up because central government has this heavy handed um, attitude that they can do whatever they want. But at the end of the day, they can't do it without people actually complying and being prepared to work towards that. Like any law, if it's a bad law, people will not accept it and there will be constant issues around this. So um, consultation needs to start from the ground up on this matter, I think, because central government has been so deaf on the on the complaint so far. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I'll ask and then Councillor Weddy, then I have a further question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to come back here so you can see me. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, Councillor Jonathan Larson here. Um, just going forward from your suggestion, I mean, I, I've never had an opportunity in council to vote down three waters because um, it got mandated before we actually got to that stage. And I didn't ever like the idea and I didn't like the government structure, but never actually came came to the fore until we got to that point. But just I'm just picking up on your point you've made about how do we take this forward from a ground roots perspective. So obviously it's very unpopular generally throughout the community. And your suggestion was that um, as a ground uh, a grassroots movement it needs to be um, you know reaching a point of perhaps um, civil disobedience at a council level where we don't agree we don't act to hand assets over and we don't comply is that what you're suggesting i think it's a matter of if enough councils voice their definite no we do not want this surely it would look very very bad if government persisted with this, if we just roll over and say, well, there's really nothing we can do about it, uh, we're just going to let it go. This is what we need in democracy. We need to argue over these points and we need to have discussions. So, for example, any involvement. I think most people are scared of issue because as soon as you criticize anything to do with Maori or co-governments, you're being accused of being um, racist. That is not the right attitude. We need to be able to disagree on items and we need to stand firm and argue over it. So if enough councils in New Zealand, and there's lots of them, <laughs> if enough councils go back um, to government and say, we've got consistent feedback that this is not what people want, surely they must listen. And I mean, I, I realize there's only so much you can do, but I just don't think we should agree with it. We should keep voicing our concern and saying, no, this is going to be a disaster and it will be. I mean, Kaipara has got very small opportunity and every job that we lose is another family that will potentially lose our uh, move away from our community. And by centralization, it will be in Auckland. We really need more people to move into Auckland. Shouldn't we distribute um, communities out of the big cities rather than into them? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weddy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, Alex, thank you very much for your presentation. And I you know, applaud your um, getting a, a survey out like this and getting some actual factual data. I, I think. Looking at that data, though, there's one issue that I, I've picked on, which I think I'd just start, like to query you on. One of the questions, and question two, you say, tick as many of the following statements that you agree with. And the first one is, 16 million does not reflect the true asset value. And 80, over 80% agree that that was not the true asset value. The 16 million um, better off package was not meant to be tied or even associated with asset values. That is a separate portion of the three waters agenda that, that uh, the central government is projecting. And what concerns me is when you, such a large number of your respondents agree with a statement which is not actually relevant to this particular $16 million package, how well informed were your, were, were your respondents? Did you give them a package of information so they could familiarise themselves with what's actually on offer, because when you get your lead question getting such a large support and it's not relevant, it does tend to put into question how much of the other questions or how many of the other questions are actually being answered with a good understanding of what the question of what the whole issue is about. So just asking the question, how well informed were your respondents? That is actually exactly our point. People do not know 
what the government is actually offering because there was no public discussion about what they want to do. So the $60 million, does that mean that, as I understand it, once you accept the $60 million, you you basically saying, while we may not agree, we're going to take it and we will be quiet from now on. So is it an actual bribe or an incentive? Uh, does it go anywhere towards the costs? How are they going to assess this? That's exactly our point. And we did not provide any information to show that people do not know exactly what is actually on the table. Have they even said how much money we're going to get paid? Is that anywhere near the amounts in our uh, balance books of the KDC? Does that include the land value where the dams are located? Um, so that's exactly my point. People don't know, and we did not give any information because th there's none none <coughs> available easily unless you read the actual um, bill, which is not easy reading for someone who works from eight to until five, have a lot live, lie to live, and then they're supposed to read two hundred pages worth of gobbledygook. That's exactly my point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, just a, a couple of things. You made a statement there, uh, Alex, regarding uh, this council not doing enough and that other councils are doing lots. Um, so are you aware that Kaipara District Council is one of the 31 councils of New Zealand which has put ratepayer money into funding a group called Communities for Local Democracy, which, if you like, is the club of the 31 councils that are saying that this entire Three Waters story should be stopped. Um, so are you aware of that? I am aware of it, but I was. we were concerned about the feedback that was mentioned at the last council meeting. That was really what started um, our um, querying public sentiment towards this. Because, um, yes, I am aware that Kaipara is part of that group of 30 odd councils that are opposing it more vocally than others do. Um, but it was their comment to say that the feedback was take the money and worry about it later. That is what we did not want. We don't want to take the money because it's always like we are um, quietly agreeing by taking the money that yes, this should go ahead. And that's what we don't want. It's it's. I realize $60 million is a lot of money, but it isn't a lot of money when we make a stance and we say, keep your money. We don't want it. We are our own. Um, we are our own people. We can fund our own projects. We don't need you to pay us $16 million to keep our mouths shut. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, oh. A final question from me is um, regarding submissions to the Water Entities Bill, which is the key piece of legislation that's coming, and you've mentioned it in your presentation. Are you aware that the 22nd of July is the close off date for public submissions to that water entities bill? And what if is what are you and each of the people who uh, provided information for your survey, the people in the room today? What, what what's everyone doing about making submissions to the government to have a force of numbers to say, um, please look at this aspect of your proposed legislation? We have shared wide and far with um, within Dargaville, which is where I am, um, but also in other areas of Kaipara that people need to get more involved. Um, I think over the last couple of years, it has become very clear that people have um, become too complacent and are not participating 
in either local government or central government. Because as long as things just trudged along, nobody really worried too much whether we were slightly mid-right or slightly mid-left national labor. It, it didn't really matter because things just went along as they always have. But I think over the last few years in particularly, things have come to a point where many issues are now separating people in the community rather than drawing them together. So the focus is always on how can we tear the fabric of community apart rather than how can we accept that we don't always agree, but we still come to, come to a democratic consensus. So me and the people that I talk to and that I work with have been very active on a lot of issues, not just three waters, but of course, this is now the most pressing one at the moment. So yes, we have been um, making submissions both to government bills as well as um, online surveys, uh, sharing information that we think is important. The frustrating thing is though that especially central government simply does not listen. Hence our more um, proactive approach in trying to make our voices heard because they just don't listen. We've made submissions on so many issues and all you ever get is an acknowledgement and then they do what they want anyway. And I don't think that's going to work for very much longer because people are sick and tired of it. Um, very, very clear. Thank you, um, elected members. Are there further questions for clarification? David, David Councillor Wills. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Hi, it's David Wills here. Um, um, my question for you is, is in your effort to push this aspect of government policy, how are you going to keep it on track with this one subject when I look at all your supporters here today and not one of them is wearing a mask, which is a completely separate <laughs> angle of government? So, so what, what is your question? Please. My, the reason I'm asking that question is that regardless of the, the presentation, you've made it a much broader protest against the government as opposed to on the topic which you brought to the table. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Quiet. Sorry, quiet there in the back. The, the, the not so people are not to talk. This is not, I'm asking a question of the petitioner and it's a valid question. Yes. Respect your questions regarding three waters. It's been one of the things that's challenged all of us at council and it, and, it, and Kaifa has been outspoken, but you've also made valid points that talking doesn't achieve the outcomes we were looking for. And I accept that. And if the presentation was on the do better or the, the, the $15 million and it was called a bribe and I'm one of the councillors that also called it a bribe, fine. But if you're going to focus on this, how are you going to get that focus when there's obviously other aspects to this presentation that have been presented to us in this public audience? Let's just say we... Uh, Councillor Wills, your question was clear. Thank you. Alex, thank you. Sorry, there must be a delay because I keep talking over you. Sorry about that. Um, we are a, a large number of concerned people and different people focus on different issues. Now, some of our, uh, some of my friends and acquaintances take this issue particularly seriously. So they focus on this um, but there are a, a, a whole range of issues that we are concerned about, but that is a different matter. But yes, we will keep at this um, because at the end of the day, a submission doesn't have to be 300 pages long. It simply has to say, we don't agree. This is going to be bad for us, you know, bullet points. So we can do this as well as other things. But the main focus today is three waters is not acceptable to the Kaipara community. It is another nail in the coffin, removing jobs Thank from you. our area. 
Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, very, that's very clear. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you, Alex, for your uh, for your presentation uh, again, and thank you everyone for coming. If this was the the principal piece you were coming to hear, uh, we're at the conclusion of this item. We'll be moving to the next subject now. So, if you were expecting a conversation between and among the elected members. Uh, that does not occur in this forum. Okay, so uh, that is the nature of the beast. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the earlier question, 22nd of July is the date on which submissions to the uh, the government's bill uh, end. So and close. So uh, if you're wanting to make your voice heard, that is the forum in which to do that. Thank you. So at this point, thank you, Alex, for your presentation. Elected members have asked their questions for clarification. We're at the end of this item. Uh, so we will be moving on to the next item now. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you very much for hearing me. OK, thank you, Alex. Thank you. So we're moving on to item number 2.2 .2 for today, uh, which is already on the screen, uh, which is the the Corporu Community Development Group Incorporated. Uh, and so we have a presentation. So if any people are leaving now, if you would do so as quietly as possible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I think it is beholden of you as the Mayor to to remind the public that they are able to stay for the I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did so. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock, I said that earlier. You may not have been listening. I invited everyone to stay for the entire agenda, which is jam packed. Today. So everyone's very welcome to stay. Yeah. The, the public is entitled to attend every single ordinary council meeting. It is your democratic right. You do not have to leave at any time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, but thank you. I'd already said that, Councillor Delavaris Woodcock, but thank you for reiterating the earlier points. Thank you. So uh, at this point, we're being joined uh, from Te Kōpuru, right across the other side of Kaipara District, uh, by, uh, and we're having, just having some technical screen-related issues here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we have some silence there in the back? Thank you. Just uh, so we're being joined by Ron Walters, Roxanne Kelly, and possibly Dorothy Hutchinson. Tēnā uh, koutoru. Uh, good morning uh, from the other side of Kaipara District, uh, and I uh, am looking forward to hearing your presentation for five minutes. Uh, and then there will be questions for clarification from elected members. So uh, thank you, Morena. Uh, Morena, it's um, great to be here and thank you. Um, I'm Roxanne Kelly and I'm representing the uh, Te Kopru Community Development Group. I have with me Violet Hutchinson and you'll see that Ron Walters is on the screen. Um, my um, presentation is going to be very brief. We feel that the, there is quite a big um, presentation in front of the councillors. We don't want to waste too much time with that. But um, we really want to thank you for um, allowing us to have this opportunity to look at developing our Tecopra domain. Um, we're well on our way with working with our community. And by becoming having a licence to occupy, it's going to be able to allow our community to access external funding that Kaipara District Council possibly couldn't have. And we already have. Um, we've managed to get 14,000 for our development plan, which is the, should be in front of you. And that was through Stella. That was um, through some funding for change through the, from the Department of Internal Affairs, who's been sitting alongside us for the last seven months. They've also given us another 30,000 towards the pump track, and we've received 15,000 from the Minister of Social Development for our fitness pod to go onto the park. We're still active in looking for funding, and so this will give us an opportunity to further um, develop that uh, de that domain for the um, community and to meet their aspirations. So you've probably um, already know a little bit about it, 
but we'd also like to let you know that we've also been working alongside the Department of Internal Affairs on a community-led project. They've um, it's been quite a process. It's taken seven months, but on Saturday it was announced at our Matariki event that we've been successful with our community-led project as a partner, which is going to be able to give us the catalyst for some change in our community. It's going to strengthen our community capacity, and it's also going to build connections with other areas of funding for us. So it's a massive project, and it's going to be a massive thing for our community. So I'm open to questions, and um, I've actually had to stay back because I should be taking a seniors class at this moment. There's 20 people waiting for me at a hall. So I'm just going to quickly, hopefully not too long, and I need to, as I need to, write, uh, to leave, but Ron and Violet probably could out, answer any further questions. So if you'd like to ask any questions, I'm open to the floor. Thank you, Roxanne. Uh, very clear. Uh, elected members, are there questions for clarification? Councillor Withy. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just curious as to whether or not you have, uh, this up till now, made contact with the uh, the um, chairman of the Mungafai Activity Zone, um, because what you're seeking or your vision as far as this development is concerned, looks to incorporate a lot of the uh, activities that are in that exact activity zone. And I just thought that the experience that they, that group has had over the last 10 years of putting that activity zone together might be able to help you in developing this um, uh, zone or this this um, domain over in the Kopuru. So have, have you had any thoughts of contacting them to get their, uh, their support? Um, I've, I have been down to Mangafai and I have um, talked to some of the people there, but yes, that will be part of our overall plan, developing f further um, developments and definitely um, we were asking them about the three on three, um, which we have just done. I, in my Sport Northern role, I, I have had connections with them and supported them in some of the activity down there. So yes, definitely. Definitely not trying to reinvent the wheel. Thanks, Ms. Councillor. That's good because that put in two pump tracks in the last two or three years. And so you've got that on your uh, list of activities that you're looking to, um, to develop. And, uh, uh, yeah. So you're probably aware that I've actually built a pump track in Dargaville as well. And yeah. uh, and I'm also part of the um, mountain bike trail build as well. Yeah. So the person that we're looking at for that build would be the person who's building our um, massive mountain bike trails out at Babylon Coast. Is, um, he's an expert in that space. And our, we don't we haven't got the money to be building sealed ones. So we'll be looking, we will be looking at a, a um, dirt track at this moment. So then that's what his expertise is in that type of track. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kerno. Question and then Councillor Wills. Thank you. Hello, Roxanne. Um, I'm just wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about the community involvement so far in this project. Sort of how how have you been working with the community and what's their yeah what's their role different parts of the community? We've um, there's been continuous consultation with the community for this. It has gone right back several years, um, and it's had um, corporate district councils um, input. And so we've had various activities. Um, probably the latest, some of the closest to this time has been the Sissy Rock mapping, which has um, indicated what the people desire for that area. Um, the pump track has been always been one that's top of the list for most of most of the aspirations. Recently, we were in the schools looking for aspirations from the children. I'm not sure whether you have that, that stuff in front of you. But we have been continuously consulting with the community, getting their feedback. And the draft plan we have is only is all information that was collated from the community. And at this moment, we've got one more consultation with the community to make that plan, take it from a draft to a final plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wills. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> hi, Roxanne. Hi, Ron. Um, I had a walk around the park of the domain on the weekend. And I mean, even just shifting the public toilets now has made a huge improvement in, in the appearance of the place, huge. 
And then look at the plan. Are the aspirations big enough considering the amount of area that's there? I, I mean, I understand that that's your first step and it's a, and it's a big step, but is it to this, the future plans that we've seen or, you know, the su suggestions, do they, the first step you want, is that sufficient scope for the amount of fundraising and the potential that you've got there? I suppose um, if we were looking at, at the whole plan, I see that what's been submitted to you is our stage one, which is it incorporates the fitness pod going in, um, probably some staging area for activities and kapahaka, et cetera, in the, the, the green area, and then the pump track and the um, three on one, three on three basketball court and um, a suitable playground because you probably notice that there's no swings or anything that for the smaller children to play on. So that's our stage one. Um, the, the actual master plan incorporates a lot more staff. So it starts to work into the, mat the fields where we're looking at putting, reinstating a full football um, rugby field, um, fitness, a fitness sort of running path around the whole field, Cully pad, uh, dog park. Um, the other desire from the community was to have like freedom parking. For, we, see, we get a lot of um, uh, sort of buses coming in with that people. And we noticed in the holidays, people were parking and using the toilets and staying in Te Kaupuru overnight or for, for a couple of days. They were sort of freedom parking. And we would rather have somebody freedom park in a designated area than just all over the place. But that's just future stuff. And and I think maybe coming back to council when we start to look at the next stage, but definitely want to get the first stage done well, you know, and we will be talking to Maz and all those other people to make sure that we get stage one done well. And then we have the uh, we have the capacity possibly now with the CLP plan to meet a lot of our desires. Thank you. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. <clears throat> Question. Korua, Ron and Roxanne. Um, my question is, were you aware of the Billion Trees funding program Matariki Turako? Um, because I that, that's a source of possible funding for your crown lifted trees that are there on the map. And I also wondered on that note whether the domain has a link, I, I I think it does, am I right, to being a memorial for fallen service people? Yes, that's true. It, it, it has, has a memorial gate, that's true. Well, then but, it's um, it's directly meets the criteria for Matariki Turako funding, which is for Fano to have a living memorial to their heroes. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for that information and we'll certainly take it on board. Uh, are there further questions for clarification? Councillor Wilson-Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, kia ora, Rox, kia ora, Violet and Ron. Um, thank you so much for, for this um, presentation this morning. I was actually interested to know, is there anything further, is there any further support that you need from elected members or council beyond the life so, Yes, so, yes. Um, thanks, Erin. Nice to see you. Um, I'm just like, we do, we, the whole part of the whole project going forward is to certainly work alongside the Corporate District Council. Um, we want to work alongside, I know Amanda Bennett's made um, some, put herself aside to work with us and want to look at a strategic plan for the whole of Te Kaupuru. There's There's so many other things I could tell you about, but you guys haven't got the time and I, <laughs> um, but this is just one project that we want to get off the ground, get moving, and we've got the putia in the bank at the moment. But yes, definitely working alongside any of the elected members that want to be to become part of it. And the next stage for us is to meet with the um, minister that are going to they're going to come up here at the end of July, August, and we need to form a leadership team. So. The, the, the door is open if anybody wants to be part of this massive project for us. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification, elected members? 
Uh, no. One more question, Mr. Mayor. So, Wills. Thank you. Uh, one more, just one quick question, because we're going to have the presentation later about the approval process. The the, the, the governance structure. You've you've gone from a, a a fundraising group, you know, that that's had a great ambition, but now you're starting to get to the next stage. Are you confident that you've got the governance structure in place to manage what's going to be quite a significant asset? Uh, so we've we've moved since my time we've gone into a corporate society and now uh, we're charitable uh, we're working alongside um, all our leaders in our community so the development group was a group as you say uh, councillor walls but now we have a leadership team we've been forming that leadership team over the last short period and we've been putting a leadership so that's like people representing each of our organisations in Tikopru. So I think, yes, our governance is um, getting there. Um, we've still got le learnings yet, and we still um, are yet to, like we, we, when we walk to, when we actually work with the community-led project team, there will be some recommendations, even um, to who will be the fund holder. So we, at this moment, um, I have sport, uh, spoken to Sport Northland, and possibly Sport Northland could be a fund holder. Um, that's just on the table at the moment of who will lead us in the governance of that that project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, looking around the table, um, we are at the end of this presentation now. There are no further questions for clarification from the councillors. So uh, thank you, Roxanne. Uh, thank you, Ron, and thank you, Violet, for your pre presentation today. Uh, of course, the item, the decision item is coming up, I'm going to say, in, in about five minutes' time. We've got another item between here and there. Okay, but you're very welcome, uh, Gavin Dawson, they're welcome to stay on. You're welcome to keep your, your links open on the screen so that you can observe the council meeting for that. Uh, decision that's coming up in a few moments. All right, thank you. But thank you for your very clear presentation today and uh, wishing you well for the rest of the day. Kia pai tora. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we're moving on to item number three in today's agenda, which is the confirmation of the open minutes of the 25th of May. And Councillor Kuno is doing this, and I'm seeking a seconder for these minutes. Councillor Wilson Collins, thank you. Is there any uh, discussion on the minutes? None, thank you. We're putting this to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against, carried. Thank you. So those uh, minutes are now confirmed. It's a true and accurate record. Thank you. Uh, section four of today's agenda, notice of motion. There are no notices of motion. So we're moving on to our decision-making section of today's meeting, uh, which is, and we're starting with number 5.1, and Councillor Wills is seeking to move this item, and Councillor Wilson-Collins uh, is seconding this item regarding the Te Kōpuru domain. So, uh, so at this point, we have uh, two of our staff are going to make an official presentation to the council. Uh, we have Jenny Rooney and Fleur Denise uh, make a presentation. So, uh, Good, uh, thank you for um, allowing us to represent the uh, Tokopuru Community Development um, Group's um, proposal uh, application for a development agreement for the Tokopuru domain. So this um, the what they've put before us is that they would like to develop the stage one of the domain. We've also included the master plan, which is currently in draft and um, looking towards having that finalised in the next month. Um, but Fleur and I will be working with, with the group um, along their stage one. So we're taking it that this report is read and if you would like to ask us any questions. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, so questions for clarification, elected members. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. Um, thank you, Fleur. Thank you, Jenny. My question is uh, why the licensed occupy is staged in this way 
and is there an intention for the Tupapuru uh, Community uh, Society Group to eventually have a license to occupy the whole domain as their master plan shows? That would be yes. the ideal, yes. And so, so was there a reason why it was chose to be done in stages? Stages um, to support the group and to be able to um, tangibly be able to complete stage one um, and then work towards each of the stages as they're able to get um, finances in. Because if they took over the whole park, that would, that would include the maintenance for them from, from the beginning of that development agreement and um, the costs which they'd incur, would, they don't have that sustainable amount at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kerno. Question? Um, kia ora, thanks. I was going to ask about ongoing maintenance. So how, how is it envisaged? Is it envisaged that the group would be responsible for maintaining eventually the whole of the area or is council still going to have responsibilities around maintaining certain parts, mowing, that sort of thing? What, what's the plan there? The wider picture would be in consultation with parks and reserves um, in terms of the car park, the drainage and the field. Um, which is why we've kept the footprint to the smaller stage one area at this stage, so we put the group and what they're capable of. Right. So the intention is that they're the, the sort of the, 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 the common use area is sort of, for want of a better word, and with us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes. And then the specific activity zone areas would be responsibility of the development group. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. They're very simple ones. On page two of your report, in the discussions, um, the in the what well, the second sentence there, you've mentioned about a draft master plan for the domain anticipated to be finalised at a community meeting on the nineteenth of June. Now, I didn't catch that in the earlier presentation from Roxanne. Did it finalised at the nineteenth of June? No, my understanding is it hasn't been finalised. And what I it's not. No, and what I did hear Roxanne say is that they've got one consultation to do with the community, and then they'll have it finalised. Um, she said that in her present previous presentation. Okay, thank you. So just cross checking with this. Thank you. Okay, and then also in the same paragraph of the um, discussion section here, uh, the final sentence says, and I'm just seeking clarification of what this means. A similar group of KDC SMEs that are working with Mangfai Community Park. Dot, dot, dot. Now, a SME to me means a small and medium sized enterprise. So, just checking what's an SME in this sense? Subject matter, matter experts. Subject matter experts. Well, there you go. Just there you go. So, it's not about business development. Okay, all right. Subject matter experts. Okay, thank you. So it's Add through the chair as well that we um, we will be formally if, if today they have this approved we'll be formally put into our project team so that we will on an agenda item weekly to support the group with their um, development. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Further questions for clarification, Councillor Wills. Thank you. That was sort of part of one of my questions: the council support for this group because. It's not just this project that now I'm saying, it's also the renovation of the buildings and, and the main street and things like that. They're, they're getting significant support finally to cope with it. Is there a delegated councillor, staff member that's going to be able to liaise with them to help them while they get up and running? Yes. Is that, whose role is that going to be? So we'll do that through our project team, through our original project team for the, the one we've got from Five Community Park. We're going to um, increase that and bring in other groups as well, so that it'll be the um, Tokopu Development Group. Um, and also, we um, have community advisors within the community team who will also work alongside as well. But primarily, it will be I, I lead that project group. So there'll be sorry, thank you. So there'll be space in our LTP to, to support them, not just with money, but also with resources to help them with the application we're going to be doing and things like that. Yeah, but through our team. Yeah. Thank you. And the other question I've got, which is just I'm looking at the plan, is the new public toilets that are there. I take it that we're keeping them outside of their um, area, just it's right on the line, run right over the top of it. So I'm just get, yeah. uh, I wouldn't like them to have to pick up the tab for that maintenance. No. So we're retaining that as part of yes, council's asset. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? 
No further questions. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Fleur, uh, for your um, participation here. And so we're going to go now to Councillor Wills with his opening statement. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, the presentation we had before was, was an interesting one for me. The Trapper Community Development Group has been fundraising for years with cake stalls and other activities. And as explained by Roxanne Kelly, it was a group. But it, and I've watched them change from that into now an incorporated, incorporated society. And now they've got people like Ron Walters with huge nationwide business experience, and they've got Roxanne with Sport Northland experience. The group itself has changed the dynamics and the ability to manage a project of this scale. And as I mentioned, it's not the only project this group's picked up. They're also picking up the renovation of the hall on the main road as well. Um, so I'm speaking in favour of this as a, as a group that is becoming well structured and now will be well funded and hopefully supported with council resources. The domain is it's a huge flat section. It's basically the council's just mowed for the last however many years with minimal. Um, enjoyment by the local community. So I look forward to seeing what happens over the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson Collins. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I reiterate everything that, that Councillor Wills has, has said. I, I think this is a really awesome example um, with the TKDC picking up um, a project and finding funding elsewhere. Um, we're, we're um, council funding may not be available to develop such an area, and they're really running with it, and it's an absolute success. And uh, yeah, I'm also in support of the small community coming together, creating, wanting to create a space for their children and their families um, in a place where there is minimal facilities and minimal funding available um, through council resources. So. Yeah, I just think this is an absolute success, and I give full credit to everyone involved um, back in Sikorpuru. So well done. And I'm obviously I'm in support. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Kerno, statement. Um, yeah, I just um, want to sort of add my um, compliments to the community. Um, Sikorpuru has a long history of standing up for itself. Um, there's many, many instances where Sikorpuru has kind of planted its feet firmly and said, no, this is what we want. And yet what's happening here is kind of the next level um, in terms of coordination and efforts and collaboration amongst the community. But I also want to comment on, on the sort of count the council's role evolving in the way that um, we're working with communities in much more of that kind of facilitation, enabling, supporting space. And so I'm really sort of heartened to see the way that the project team is is working around these um, community groups to really lift, help lift them up to this next level, which actually is a space where we can see huge things getting done, as we can see in the Mangfai Community Park is one of those examples. So there's yeah there's a there's a lovely synergy going on here between a community that's always stood up well for itself and a bit of sort of the right kind of support for count from council amazing things can happen so yeah thank you um are there further statements a uh, quick statement for me is this is um, a, a welcome new development from um inside the community at Te Kōpuru. Um as councillor kerno has just alluded to you're following the lead of um, other successful parts of Kaipara District. Uh, looking forward to seeing uh, this, uh, the group uh, and under this license to occupy, both developing this space and also uh, taking it to the whole next level for that community. Since I've been mayor around this council table, there's often been discussion about the absence of any playground or space or or, or kind of fitness space, if you like, in the Kōpuru community and facilities, the absence of facilities for, uh, for the community. And as we all know, with MAS, particularly, the creation of those facilities is very, very expensive because you can't just bang something up with bits of six per two and nails and pour some concrete like you used to do back in the good old days. So um, making a 
arc that's multi-use for multiple people um, in the heart of ancient old Tukupuru, um is, is a really great thing that this license to occupy opens that doorway, which has been otherwise closed for funding sources. So I welcome all of this and looking forward to it. Thank you. Any further statements? Councillor Wills, closing statement. Uh, just really briefly, Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to acknowledge the support that over the last few years I've been going started with the Tukopu community by council staff. Um, but I'm going to basically make a shout out to the Tukopu group that they have done this themselves. And they have they've worked really hard in old fashioned fundraising, like I said, paper stalls and they had a museum, I think, showed um Tukopu history this last weekend. Um, it's been a community driven activity and I hope that Tukopu can retain those community leaders that they've now got in this group and keep pushing ahead with this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So we're putting this to the vote now regarding this license to occupy application. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, Roxanne and Ron and Violet. That's um, a clear um, outcome, and that was a unanimous decision by the council here. So, um, wishing you well for the rest of your day. Thank you. Right, uh, moving on with item number 5.2 today, the annual plan and uh, this important item, um, I would like to move this and Deputy Mayor Kuno is seconding this. Thank you. And so for our presentation, uh, today we have uh, Michaela. Michaela, it's under the mask. I was going, oh, Michaela, Michaela and Graham Coleman. Um, so uh, wonderful to see you here today. Thank you. And so Graham Coleman, of course, is speaking from the finance side of the annual plan, and Michaela is speaking regarding the document uh, that we can see here today. So thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, so, yeah, today we're presenting the annual plan 2022 23 for adoption. Um, as outlined uh, in the report, the plan rates rise um, in the LTP for year two was 7.13%. Um, but through uh, Council's request to reduce this, um, the team have worked through some study events, and today in the annual plan, we're uh, presenting the average um, rates rise is 4.86%. Uh, um, so that's what we're presenting today. So I'll pass over to Graham to, to talk through the financials in a bit more detail. Okay. Thanks. So what we've presented here is essentially what was um, shown to you at the May briefing. Um, the numbers are the same. We haven't made any changes other than doing some internal cost allocations once it went into our planning software. Uh, as Michaela said, the uh, uh, rate increase that was presented at that briefing is exactly the same as that. We haven't altered that at all. Um, we had some board questions that came through from Councillor Delavance Woodcock, so I'll just take you through those, if that's okay. Uh, first question related to the additional uh, asset management staff, and you asked whether they're related to Three Waters. They do. Um, the staff are required to help us um, work on the our asset records. Um, it's been an issue that's been raised by the auditors for the last few years, and so they're working to get those asset records in order. Um, and to make sure that they're up to date. Um, the next question related to the Raupo floodgate and the Tacopa Road stock banks. Um, those projects are multi-year. So when the plan was put together, um, we took some of the budget out of the current year and moved it into the annual plan. So that is a multi-year one, which is why it was presented at the um, externally funded um, projects committee meeting and why it's in the annual um, plan for next year. So the overall budget for that doesn't change. It's just spread across the two year period. Um, the one on the employee benefits, I'll come back to that one because I think Louise will answer that one for me. And the last one was around the, uh, the 5% I mentioned in the document. That actually sits in the revenue and financing policy, which is in the long-term plan. And that plan spans the life of 
this annual plan and the next one, which is why it's not specifically mentioned in this document. So that policy is live. It's Council's live revenue and financing policy, and that's where that reference sits. And it relates to the wastewater, not the water supply. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's the all hope I had. Thank you. Through the chair, in relation to the questions you've asked around the employees, so um, there's nine new staff. Those were set out in a combination of what was in the LTP and in the subsequent paper that came to uh, Council for those additional roles. The REM increase talked about in that paper in April um, and the retention strategy payments again that were in that paper in April. So combination of all of those is what makes up the increase. Of, of 17, now $17 million. So the figures we're taking, yes, so effectively, and then that's made up, as I say, of the four roles that were in the LTP, right, and five additional ones that came in that separate paper. So, um, yeah, one of the questions I asked was the $17 million for employee benefits. How, how many staff would that represent? So, the, so it's not, uh, so it's made up of the three elements. So nine new staff. Yes. REM, market movement. And retention payments. So it's not just new staff, it's made up of those three elements. Oh, I know, but what, what is the, the total staff number that that figure correlates to? Like, you know, 120 staff members or 100? And, is there a figure, please? Staff, the number of staff currently that we have in the organisation. Linked to that budget line of $17 million. So it will be whatever our current staff is plus the nine plus the additional increase in REM plus the retention payments. Which will be how many number of staff? That's my question. So what's our current, do you know what our current FTE is, Sarah? I think it's at 205 plus the nine. Okay. 205 staff plus nine. Yeah. 214. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further oh, yes. questions? Not for me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Weddy, then Councillor De La Rose Woodcock, then Councillor Larson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> yeah, question for you, Grant. Uh, <coughs> well, the, you know, we're looking at a, a reduced rate increase this year compared to what was forecast in the long term plan. And in your discussion paper, you've outlined some of the areas where, in fact, um, savings have been made to allow that uh, reduced rate increase to <coughs> I guess my question is the impact of that on the next year and how that compares with what we forecast in the long term plan, which is obviously the measure against which we, we uh, compare these rate increases because it's great to have a see the true rate rise this year, but we don't want then we probably have to climb a cliff next to you. So just wondering how that all links together. Um, I guess the biggest thing that we'll have to get over is we've taken out of the current year the waste minimisation and we've moved that to next year. So that is a mountain that's going to be in next year if we go ahead with that. Um, in terms of the cost savings that we've made in terms of for support costs, I believe that's ongoing. From what I've looked, I've gone through and reviewed all those budgets. I believe we can have that ongoing, um, which is why we've put it in here as it is. So that'll really depend on what we add into next year. And the big one is the waste minimization. And, and that would be over and above what the long term plan said for that year. And that's going to put pressure on that on that figure. Great. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Delavaris Woodcock, then Councillor Larson question. Uh, yes, so um, in the, that increase in the number of staff, how many of that relate to the Three Waters uh, asset management work? And why is it that the, um, the government is not willing to fund that extra work required for the Three Waters reform programme? So we have Sue Davidson answering. Through the chair. So the, um, we need asset managers because we have assets, not because of three waters. Yes, they will be working on three waters just as much as parks and the other property assets. But 
the um, major assets we have are obviously not three waters. We're not employing people because of three waters. We're employing them because we've got an audit um, opinion last year that we had to improve, that we weren't um, recording our assets to a, um, in good detail. And we've taken that on board. We have had um, dedicated asset managers ever in the council. We've only had them doing this part-time job. Thank so. you, So, So another question. Uh, I have looked at the new name. It's called Strategic Activity Plans, and Asset Management Plans, the 2021 figure. And from my reading of it, uh, the total value of our three water assets was something around $244 million. But there was no mention of the Browns Road Farm, the 130 hectares that we own, nor was there mention of the value of the land underneath the Thelma Park treatment facility, nor was there mention of the Waitawa Reservoir. It just said points of supply in terms of value, asset. So if we are, as you said, using SARP and paying ratepayer dollars to get a true asset value and, and a work on this, can we also have the land assets that the staff, that the council owns, uh, recorded in that asset? So, to be sure, they are recorded in detail. In the, in the, yeah, they are recorded in detail, but maybe not at the strategic level um, because of the. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't know the detail of that because I didn't write the strategic asset management plan. The people aren't there just to do that, like asset managers aren't there just about valuations. It's about getting the right amount of maintenance and being proactive rather than reactive. Um, and that's what we wanted to do is to look after our assets, not just put them in the ground or build them and then move them. And that's what we've been doing over the last 10 years. But do, do we not have to get accurate asset valuations so that we can charge the appropriate amount of depreciation? Yes, and we do that. And that's okay, that's in our um, fixed assets, and we get the value every three years independently, and um, depreciation is calculated. So, will there be an independent valuation of our land, three waters, land value assets, and reservoirs, and such like? That's fine, because he knows when the valuations appear. I think it would be two years. Yes, the water ones were done, of the water supply was done last year. We're doing wastewater this year. Um, those values are done every three years as a cyclical thing. So as Sue said, those numbers are in our um, balance sheet. They, are, they, they do reflect. Um, it's just the asset management plan stuff relates to the pipes and the articulation stuff, which sits an asset finder, and that's where the bulk of the work is, rather than those other um, land assets. But they are in our books. We do register them. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Larson, question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, thanks um, for your report. Just going to page one of your report where you talk about saving from support expenditure in uh, this financial year 22. What, what is that? Those support costs? Yeah, what, what does that mean? Um, it's, you mean the type rather than the dollar value? Well, both's fine. Yeah. The, there was about 500,000 that we've sort of saved and it's things like if staff weren't traveling as much, um, less photocopying, less office supplies. It was all of those things that support internal um, functions of the council. So we just were doing things in a better way, didn't need as much money. Okay, thank you. And just with regard to um, if we proceed with the recommendation here today, what will the average percentage rates increase for the 23-24 year be? Because that's something that's been raised in previous reporting and seemed to be absent from this. Um, and it's, it's quite an important bearing on. Um, well, we're not setting the rates for the following year. I know we're not setting working. them, but they do flow through because we're deferring projects and we must know what result, what impact it would have on the following year's rates or other things being equal. I don't have that on the top of my head at the moment. Uh, Councillor Larson, that has been discussed at briefings. I know it has been discussed at briefings and we've made amendments here and it's absent from this report. And that's why I'm asking, it's a known figure, but I don't know what it is and that's why I'm asking the question. Sorry, I would say that there are no amendments actually 
regarding today. That's fine, but I'm still being asking what the figure is. I mean, so. Mr. Chair, I don't have a figure, but what I do know is the major thing that we deferred was this waste minimisation. We don't yes. have And although the rates may drop, there will be also the reduction in the weekly spending of our residents because they won't have to buy bags and bins and freight. Yes. We don't have that at the moment, but that's primarily what the increase would be. Could, could, we have, could, I have, could I have that figure? I'm interested in knowing that figure. If you can provide it, that would be great. Thank you. So at the May Council briefing, this was discussed in great detail. Yes, and Mr Mayor, I don't remember every figure that's been raised at every briefing, and I'm entitled to ask it. So it's quite a reasonable request, actually. Sorry, yes, and also, as you know, we for any items that are be beyond the work that's immediately in front of us, we're supposed to ask them in advance so that the officers can go and get the correct report and direct elected members to yeah, them. Okay, whatever. Oh, thank you. Yeah, whatever. Right. Councillor Wills, question for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, hi, guys. Sorry. Um, there's We've been running for three years with an assumption of 1% growth, and, and I said to put that into the standard plan as well. The confidence on that 1% is at the same level that we've had previously that does have an impact on the final 8%. Yeah, I think so. We, we checked that um, about oh, a couple of months back, and we were pretty close to the 1% at that point. So we're reasonably confident that we'll be okay. Yeah. Be comfortable with the one percent growth, just as as the mitigating circumstance to get the four point nine out. Yeah, at the moment, um, the one percent seems fair. Thank you. One question. Okay, thank you. Are there further questions, Councillor Wilson Collins? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Graham. Hi, Michaela. Thank you. Um, just my question is on page one of the report under context and those bullet points of. of how we've achieved the 4.86% rates increase. <coughs> and one of those bullet points is the Dargaville Library seed funding set aside in the LTP that is no longer required. Um, I might have missed something, but I didn't think a decision had been made about that. What does set aside actually mean? Does it mean removed or does it mean delayed? So Sue Davidson will... I can, can answer that. Um, because the council has indicated wanted to, um, to apply or to look at libraries, we indicated to council that we would take out seed funding because if the government with its better off package was going to fund the library for Dargaville, we no longer needed the seed funding. The seed funding was to initially to establish a trust because that was the only way the seed was going to be able to provide for a new library for Dargaville. So if there is um, any reason that that indication doesn't come to fruition, does that mean that there's no backup plan? Like, at the time, um, and, and indications are the first thing with it, readily available to do planning for both libraries, but we revert to what proposition was in the LTV, which the data really was potentially seed funding. And getting the trust from the library. The number five was potentially to be some financial contributions or debt. So, so, just for clarification, so are you saying that in a future annual plan it could be brought back in as an item? Mm -hmm. At the moment, all we know is we've 16 million as a better off package. We currently have two libraries provided for. This is a better way of funding them, or we can use government to put into our rate base money. That's the assumption we're working on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor de Lavaris Woodcock. Yes, uh, so thank you. My question, Mr. Mayor, is directed to you. Uh, is it possible in your introduction uh, to amend? Your statement. Just send me what you suggest, and I'll have a so, look. At it. 
It's, 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 the, uh, it's the mayoral introduction to the annual plan, and it's on page 39, and it says on the top of the second column, uh, Council notes the government is also progressing its three waters reforms, where water services will be provided by four publicly owned water service entities from July 2024. And I would like to ask if you could please remove that. And the reason I ask that of you is that I believe that this legitimizes what the government is doing. And I do not think it stands us in good stead as a council to legitimize this political process that is being enforced on us, as you mentioned earlier today. Okay, thank, thank you for your statement. We'll take that as part of your statement for later. But thank you. My question was, would you please remove that from the introduction? Because it's it's preempting a legislation, a Sorry. legislative Count process that has not happened. Councillor de Lavaris, thank me. you. It's my question. You. Uh, so my simple statement is this, all right? The foreword here is very, very clear. And that is what the government is proposing. And and my question back to you is, is that or is that not what the government is proposing? There is a general election in between July. Sorry, yes, we all know that. And so why? And so Councillor De Lavaris will stop. All here, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, this is what the government is proposing, Councillor De Lavaris Woodcock. Okay, so you you would not remove it from the introduction. So the point that is being made here, all right, which is very clear, okay, needs to be made in statements later regarding this item. All right, thank you. I'm hearing your concerns. Question, it was a I'm question. I'm hearing your concerns, thank you. Uh, and as it says here, there are minor editorial changes may be possible made by either the chief executive or myself, okay, based on the discussion from the meeting. All right, so thank you. It will all be being considered for later. Thank you. Councillor Kerno, question for clarification. Question of Graham, um, just relating to um, the impacts of Three Waters, what's the auditor's recommendation for an annual plan and how they account for this? What is the position that auditors have on this? At the moment, it's just business as usual. In our annual report, they will make a, a note, but that's all. Right. So that, that, note that's come out from the Office of the Auditor General that all of the auditors need to make in the annual report, just to say that it's, there's an issue on the, on the table at the moment, but it has no impact on what we are doing. We're just business as usual carrying on. Okay. Sorry, so what, what you're saying is that we are supposed to presume that it is going to happen, but also as if it's not happening? If it's not happening, we just present our accounts as though it's not happening. We need to fund our activities as though it's not happening. Yes. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Clear. Uh, Councillor Wills. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just following on from that um, conversation, Graham, last year when the um, Wakatahi didn't give us our funding in time, we ended up getting an auditor's note put to our accounts. Are we going to end up with another auditor's note put to our accounts? On, on the basis of what you've just said? Uh, yeah, the, the Waka Kitahi one was a emphasis on matter, so it's not actually qualification. Um, I understand that the one on three waters this year will be an emphasis on matter, and every single council in the country will have to have that same one on their auditor's report. But, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. But, but on that topic, though, at the council, because of its past financial management, we've done, made a real effort. I'm not making a statement, I'm, 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 we've made a real effort to be absolutely clear on our financial management and getting it right from the stage of where it was, are we at risk of another qualification? No, no, that's not a qualification. No. That's just my question, but my concern is to have us clean it. That is a clean opinion, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you, Graham, and thank you, Michaela, Sue, uh, uh, and Louise, for the answers to the questions. Thank you. Uh, the, the annual plan, as we have uh, discussed here, and it has been traversed in great detail, 
uh, over many months, and we've had to uh, be rebuilding and recasting the story for next year uh, as we have gone through the last uh, six month process of reconsidering uh, the budgets and how this council is uh, best facing its future. Uh, this annual plan is doing that uh, and it does it very comprehensively uh, in an extremely changing environment for councils. As has been indicated, the large waste minimisation uh, project has been moved out of the next financial year to subsequent years. The, uh, the indication at this point uh, from the May Council briefing uh, is that the next year's average annual rates increase could be 9.95%, uh, incorporating that very expensive waste minimisation shift. One of the things that the Council has talked to is the current environment economically with the cost of living crisis across the country. Uh, and I know for uh, many of the elected members, the awareness from ratepayers of trying to keep costs down, such as the cost that they pay in rates today, uh, is really of great significance. So the council has worked very hard to hear the voices of the people and has delivered a reduction in rates from 7.13% to 4.86%, which I would say is probably the largest rates reduction from any council across New Zealand in the current environment. Uh, so, and that shift and the flexibility of this council is significant here. Uh, these are really challenging times for council. And as we have heard uh, today, the Three Waters reforms cast a very significant shadow over the work that we're doing. As you know, for myself, my personal view is that the Three Waters reforms is absolutely terrible and is a very, very negative thing for New Zealand. And I have contributed that perspective in many other forums. And as you will also know, I'm not seeking re-election as the mayor of Kaipara District Council because of the Three Waters reforms, because I seek to go and change the direction of the government so that councils such as Kaipara can get on with doing the job of being a great council without the impacts of such extraordinary legislative and constitutional changes. You can see the shadows of those changes in this annual plan. As the staff are quite correctly saying, the government says to us, well, you have to dance this dance, but at any moment, the music could stop. And it is a very, very challenging space for councils to be in. So what, what I'm saying there is that is this isn't legislation until it is legislation regarding the three waters, and yet it's all through the work that we do. Uh, so our council, as I say, has been working very hard to uh, continue to maintain and manage services for all the people of Kaipara District, and of course, we are one of the small councils of New Zealand, not one of the big ones. So these are very, very challenging times indeed. Uh, but I commend the staff uh, for the preparation of the, the work that has gone on here. I commend uh, everyone for the many, many hours and the, the months of work and all of the briefings which culminate in today's work. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, the opportunities that are in the annual plan here uh, coming forward 
for the people of Kaipara as we grow a better Kaipara. Thank you. Councillor Kerno. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm in support of the annual plan as it stands now. It's been a long process that we've um, gone down. However, um, I do want to sort of explain that part of the um, lowered rate comes from many reasons. It comes from a deeper complexity of the waste management program, which means that those costs are being pushed forward while we think more hard, more deeply about the complexity of delivering that in a, a district such as ours, which is um, diverse in terms of rural, urban, ultra rural, all sorts of different types of places. To be able to do waste minimization across all of those types is complex. So we've pushed those costs forward. There's also been, for our council, a huge focus on these extra infrastructure projects that central government have funded for us. And that means that, again, some of the work that we might ordinarily have been done kind of gets nudged forward. We've had staff problems in terms of staff turnover, which is across the, the um, industry. It's not unusual that we've had these staff problems. But again, it makes it harder to deliver what we're already committed to delivering. So those things get pushed forward. So the end result is, yes, we've got a lowered rate rise this year, but we're going to have a bigger one next year. And this comes to the heart of one of the big problems that local government faces in New Zealand is pushing, kicking the can down the road. And that's how we've ended up in some of the problems that we have with, with Three Waters kicking the can down the road, not funding them when they need to be funded. And here we are for lots of reasons, not, not just the politics around the table of wanting to keep the rates increase as low as we can, but lots of reasons of meaning that we are now pushing problems into the future. And that concerns me. I feel we don't have much of a choice here, but it really concerns me that this is a classic example of local government brewing trouble for the future. That's my piece. Thank you. Further statements? On three councils, um... oh, no, sorry, there's no commentary from the floor. Sorry, further statements. Councillor De La Varis Woodcock. Uh, yes, so I, I will speak in uh, opposition to a, this annual plan. Uh, and my reasons for that are because uh, I uh, acknowledge the staff's work in um, drop finding savings <clears throat> to drop the proposed rate rise from 7.13% to 4.86%, and that is commendable. However, it wasn't about kicking cans down the road. It was about finding cost savings in fuel usage because people working from home, cost savings in electricity and stationary and unfilled positions. It was not about kicking cans down the road. Uh, so I, I acknowledge the staff's good work in finding those savings uh, in, to enable us to have an, a more or a, a lessened rates rise. However, I am shocked that $17.3 million is scheduled for the 2022 to 2023 year on employee benefits with a number of 214 staff. When I first served as a councillor, we had 111 staff. This is an incredible and unsustainable swelling of staff number numbers. As a representative of the Kuiper District people, I could support that if I could see a concomitant or parallel increase in our levels of service. These are first world rate prices we are paying. We do not, we have third world roads, we have third world recycling, and waste minimization. We, uh, we must find efficiencies. When times are tough, businesses tighten their belt. People have to work harder. 
I cannot support the annual plan figure. Thank you. Thank you. Further statements, Councillor Larson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I um, have managed to find the numbers that I was looking for, and it appears that the Mayor had that number as well for the 20. 24 year at 9.95 percent resulting from the deferrals and um, that's in a report dated the 4th of may from the council briefing the um, long-term plan was the last time we actually went out and consulted with the community and we um, agreed to a um, rates in the pre 2023 to 2024 year of 3.92%. Um, so the deferral and expenditure adds another 6.03% for the following year, giving a total of 9.95%, all other things being equal. Um, so I, I think that. Uh, we are setting ourselves up a little bit with that. Um, I do have some sympathy for council staff um, with relation to what Councillor Delavaris Woodcock has just alluded to, and the, the suggestion that we need to be making cuts. However, this council has asked the council staff to provide all manner of um, initiatives through staff, including some things that I personally consider to be nice to have rather than need to have. And if we had given staff a mandate just to stick to basic services, then the um, the uh, staff benefits figure could well be a lot lower. For such time as this council actually gives that direction to staff, it makes it very hard for staff to bring the number down and still deliver all of these nice to have things that we're doing as if we're in a uh, very uh, strong economic position. And my concern is that things are just going to get harder and harder for rate payers. We bring a figure down this year and then put it way up again next year. I don't know where it's going to get us to that basis. I, I'm uh, concerned about this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Further statements? Councillor Wilson Collins, then Councillor Wills. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I appreciate all the comments being made the, this morning from my um, scholar elected members. It's, um, it's always an interesting time when we're setting the annual plan and, and the next item on the agenda as well. Um, I, 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 I can hear and, and sort of concur with quite a few things that have been said this morning. Um, the, the concern to it, like, obviously, sorry, congratulations and thank you so much to the staff for this massive amount of work that has gone into getting this rates increase lowered. Um, because, yes, our community has been very vocal about um, affordability. Um, we're all living in the same world. The cost of living has increased exponentially for everybody, and it's a really, really tough time out there. So, so thank you. Like, that, that's a real plus. Um, but also concerns of, of projects that have been put off. Um, the waste minimisation has been put off till next year, um, not just because of the rates increase, but also because of the timing of it and the government reforms around waste minimisation and being able to make sure we deliver the project well when we do deliver it. Um, but I am really concerned that when we come to next year, something else is going to happen to that project and, and, and it's just never going to happen. Um, and when I travel the country, it, it, it's, it's really eye-opening to see how low our levels of service are in that area. Um, and the other thing is our composting um, system has gone completely. So that, and, and, and that's a real shame. Um, and we've got a really awesome project down here in Mangapai with um, sustainable kaipara who are, who are actually trialing composting in the community and um, and that is now gone from the long-term plan. These are the sacrifices that have to be made to keep rates to affordability levels. So comments of we can fund our own projects unfortunately is just not true for our community. Um, it's a really difficult space that we're working in. So so yes, thank you so much. 4.86% 
that's a miracle um, from where we were sitting earlier this year. But next year is going to be a, a huge, huge challenge. And who knows what is going to happen in between now and then anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm just completely torn. I don't know what the answer is, but right now I'm a little bit celebratory and a little bit really <laughs> frustrated. But, but that's not the staff's fault. I, I commend you for what you've, you've been able to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wills, statement. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, my comments are, are purely to thank the management and staff for having been asked whether rightly or wrongly on what we wanted as a council and that they've delivered. And that's my comment to this. Um, Louise, Sue, Graham, the, the general managers of the departments, as a council, rightly or wrongly, we asked them to tighten down as hard as they could go. And I just, while we were talking, had a quick look at what other councils around us with regard to rates increases. They're not going to like what we come out with because it makes the regional council in particular look poor managers of their funding. I'm going to be quite blunt in saying that. Um, yes, there are consequences, um, and that's the reality. But my focus here on my comments is purely on the success of the staff delivering in this annual plan what we asked them to do as a council. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Weddy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, um, I, I sort of concur with um, Councillor Wills, and I think the staff has done exactly what we asked them to do. But I also see um, that the comments that uh, Councillor Kerner made about kicking the can down the road are very true as well. We've only achieved this reduction in rates largely through the deferral of a capital project that we've consulted on during the long term plan. And, and while um, we've been advised by staff that some of the savings that assisted in getting it down to 4.5% to are going to be continuing into the future, the big bogey for next year and the years after is going to be these capital projects that we've deferred. As what staff have done is, is, is really um, very, very uh, good and done exactly what we've asked. However, from a political point of view, the community is going to have a very, very short memory. In 12 months' time, they're not going to remember the efforts that were made to get a rate increase below the current level of inflation in this country. Anyone knows who's ever been in business that if you cannot grow your business equal or faster than the rate of inflation, it's not a good look for the future. And, and our levels of service are only going to be able to be maintained unless we can at least keep uh, progressing uh, with inflation to cover that extra cost that council will incur each year. So next year is going to be a very challenging year, and I, I certainly am concerned about how the community is going to be able to sustain a rate increase, increase which, as Councillor Larson has rightly pointed out, is going to be significantly more than what was consulted on in the long-term plan, uh, long plan, albeit for good reason. That's not the point when it comes to actually paying the bills every month. So I'm, I have to admit, while it's a good result, or appears to be a good result for this one year, we are not providing any smoothing. It would have been nice to have smoothed the first over two years so that the rate payers don't get hit between the eyes next year. But that's not the way the numbers have come out, and um, I hope that people will realise that next year when they see something that is probably going to be a little less easy to digest than the very good result the staff have been able to provide for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The um, wide range of comments here, uh, and certainly it's uh, very important to have that reflection, which you hear around the table very much of uh, concern for the uh, the, as Councillor Weathy says, the smoothing effect, as Councillor Kurnow has indicated, what happens next. Of course, that is why Council prepares a long-term plan in the first instance, uh, which is to get a decade-long view of exactly year on year on year what uh, will, will be happening uh, or would be proposed to be happening in the space. Um, there, are, there are many great challenges for a small council 
taking on a large, large project. And I just would like to reiterate that I'm going to say Kaipara District Council has, is it fewer than 8,000 ratepayers? Rate paying properties is about that number. It's even though there may be twenty five, fourteen thousand. Sorry, um, there 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 are twenty five thousand people. There's only fourteen thousand rate paying properties or rate payers here. So when you come to a large capital project, um, it's spread between very few people regarding paying for those things. So. The, uh, the, the challenge that we have, of course, before us is very clear, but we have to get the plan for the annual plan for the next year. As Councillor Wills has said, uh, we tasked the staff to go away and to prepare significant uh, work, uh, which they have done, and they have come back and delivered that for us here. And so as we go to the vote now, uh, it, it's, uh, like I say, with thanks to all of the staff for the work that's gone on here, and with a simple point that I make, that um, if this vote fails, then basically the council reverts back to a 7.13% rates increase, uh, because basically we revert back to what is in the long-term plan. Uh, so that is the decision that is before the elected members as of now. So uh, so we're going to go to the vote now. Thank you, Mr. Maris, and we're doing this by division. Thank you. Three, you worship. Uh, Councillor Kerno. Four. Councillor Dadavaris Woodcock. Four. Councillor Larson. Four. Councillor Vincent. If you may be absent, you worship. Absent. Councillor Worthy. Four. Councillor Wills? Four. Councillor Wilson Collins? Four. You wish it? Four. You wish it? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. So we have an annual plan adopted at this point. Thank you uh, very much, everybody. At this point, uh, I would like to adjourn for a 10 minute break. We'll resume at 11.30. Thank you uh, for the important item of setting the rates. Thank you for a fascinating morning so far. I'm telling you.
Number 5.3, the setting of rates for linked with the next annual plan. And I'd like to move this item. It's written, and I'm seeking a seconder here. Councillor Kuno, thank you. So for this item, uh, we have uh, Christine Toms to present this item, joining up remotely. Thank you. Christine. Apologies, just trying to get my technology sorted. Uh, there we go. We can hear you, thank you. Thank you, you can see me too? Yes. Cool, thank you. Um, I do just take this as read. There's nothing um, surprising, I don't think, within this. Um, if there are any questions, um, open for those, thanks. Thank you, uh, elected members. Are there questions for clarification here? No questions for clarification. Thank you. Very simple. Thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, this item, uh, of course, is very important. Links with the annual plan that we've just discussed. This is where the um, the rubber hits the road uh, regarding rates increases, and uh, and the documentation here is very clear, and we're right on track. All of this. But I'd like to commend the staff uh, for the work that's been done here. I'd also like to go back and remind uh, all the elected members and the public about the journey that we've been on with some of the awesome new tools that we've been able to see and model, if you like, what various projects of the annual plan would look like as various rate increases in real dollar terms all various properties across the district. Uh, and 10 years ago, that would have been impossible for Kaipara District Council. Five years ago, impossible for this little council to have been able to model in such a way uh, what the impacts of any uh, rates changes would be for ratepayers. So uh, I uh, commend the work of the staff in the background regarding this work. Thank you. Councillor Kuno. Um, yeah, it, it's in line with the plan and I think I've expressed my, my views on, on the plan and, and the, the um, consequences of the plan for this year. But these rates are in line with the plan and you know, it is procedural now that we, we adopt these rates. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements here? No further statements. We'll go right to a vote then. We're doing this, Mr. Maris, by division. Thank you. For your worship, uh, Councillor Kerno. Four. Councillor Dadavaris Woodcock. Four. Councillor Larson. Four. Councillor Vincent. Councillor Weavey? Four. Councillor Wills? Four. Councillor Wilson Collins? Four. And your worship? Four. That's carried, your worship. Thank you. That's clear. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, um, Graham and Christine and the team, um, Sue, uh, for your great work here uh, with us. Thank you. We're moving on now to item number 5.4 the uh, change of designation uh, regarding the um, refining company limited to channel terminal services limited for this item we have paul vanders uh, to present to us thank you and i'm seeking a move of this item to put it onto the table councillor kerno thank you and a seconder here councillor wilson collins thank you paul kia ora. thank you worship councillors a very simple uh, item, but uh, necessary in terms of the law. <laughs> Firstly, the, uh, as we all know, the New Zealand uh, refining company has changed to, uh, from a refining company to an import company uh, for refined fuel. The designation uh, D63 is identify, or identifies the route of the petroleum pipeline as it goes through Capra. 
where the refining New Zealand is the requiring authority. Due to the change of the New Zealand refining company, uh, they formed a new company called Channel Infrastructure New Zealand Limited, which, would be, which could become the uh, requiring authority as all assets were transferred that would have been uh, just a change of name. However, within that particular company, there was a structure and they decided to decouple the pipeline from the refinery or from the uh, import uh, port. And that company is called Channel Infrastructure New Zealand. Or Channel Terminal Services, sorry. Channel Terminal Services Limited. Now, because that was not a, a, a requiring authority, the minister had to recognize that company uh, as a requiring authority, which the minister did. And now the district plan has to be amended to reflect the change of the requiring authority without following Schedule 1 procedure, in other words, without consultation. Uh, no changes were made to the uh, prison designation D63 except the name change, and no person is considered to be affected by this change. The cross references within the rules have been made to refer to the new company. Uh, no approval is required except that the council has to grant or approve the, uh, for the update of the Operative, operative district plan. The last aspect is that the only change that we are going to see in the exposed draft of the uh, of, uh, of the district plan uh, under the requiring authorities that has to be sh uh, shown alphabetically, and that will change before the exposure draft is brought back to council, and you will see that uh, in the exposure draft. Mm. But the designation will also have a new number, not the D63, but it has to be in terms of the national planning standard CTSD-1. So that is uh, the only the, the changes that we need to bring to the district plan. Any questions? Thank you. I'd like to remember, so are there any questions for clarification? Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. Um, yes. So, if the decision, thank you, Paul, for your presentation. If the decision around the council table was to vote against this, not approve the change of uh, designation requiring authority name, what could be the uh, result of that? The minister would instruct us to do it. Uh, why I brought it to council is that uh, staff do not have the, de uh, the delegation to do those changes. It has to be brought back to uh, to council. But in that particular case, the minister will instruct council to do the changes, and we have to do the change. Right. So it's a hierarchy of legislative power. It is in terms of uh, uh, clause uh, six, uh, clause sixteen and seventeen. Thank you. And is there any um, potential political um, influence that could be derived from a council uh, not choosing or voting against this uh, recommendation in terms of uh, securing fuel security in our country? Or is this. We have to remember that this. Mr. Chairman, that this is only for the pipeline. So for the portion that goes through Kaipara, it doesn't matter what the refining or the import aspects are, the fuel that goes through the, through the pipeline is exactly the same fuel as that went previously through the pipeline. So there is no change. To answer the other question regarding to the, the principle of such, uh, the minister takes the decision uh, if they are satisfied with the requiring authority uh, or not. The minister has consulted with various people uh, on the acceptability of the uh, refining company as well as the proposed company of their ability to do this particular work. 
and the minister has decided to make them a requiring authority. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. We'll go to uh, Councillor Bruno for her opening statement here. This is a procedural matter that we yeah, don't have any choice in. It is just a procedural matter that requires a council decision. So support it. Correct. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Wilson Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, it just seems to um it's obviously just a change of name of who owns the pipeline on our plans and our plan should be kept up to date our map should be kept up to date so um uh, that's all good thank you thank you are there further uh statements here no further statements thank you look we'll put this to the vote now all those in favor please raise your hand and say aye aye against carried thank you uh, moving on to item number 5.5, .5, the uh, private plan change 78 item. Uh, I am happy to move this item as written, and I'm seeking a seconder here. Thank you, Councillor Withy. Thank you. Uh, so it's on to the table. Thank you. Uh, so for this item, we have Paul Founders and Michael Day presenting to us. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, Councillors, this is the second to last action that has to be taken uh, to make the uh, plan change 78 history estates of Monify Central operative. Uh, I presume that the uh, full report has been uh, was available and uh, I consider that as being read. And just for the record is that the application was received on the 3rd of December 2019. <laughs> Um, I'm not going into the detail of the zoning, except if there are questions. Notification was uh, done 30th of April, and it was extended to the 4th of August. And 208 submissions and nine further submissions were received. Here it was conducted on 23rd, 25th of November, and the 3rd of February 2021. And the council's decision was on the 28th of April 2021. Uh, with their decision, there were two appeals uh, from uh, the public. The one was a, a combination of Mangapai Matters Incorporated and one from Mr. Boonham. I'm not going into the details of the um, uh, the appeals or the outcomes of the appeals, except if there are questions. There were several uh, um, Section 274 parties, and uh, in most, in all cases, agreement was reached, and I would only like to refer to one particular aspect, which is the New Zealand Ferry Turn uh, Charitable Trust, and that deals with uh, the uh, preservation of um, seabirds, and there is a agreement on fencing of the particular area and a side agreement regarding to cost and maintenance of those which will not fall onto council. All the other plus uh, uh, section 274 parties uh, aspect have been dealt with. The court's decision and its determination, there are two decisions, the one was um, uh, well, both together, 5th of April 2022, but that saw a track change version, which is also attached uh, uh, in the agenda. What we basically also had to do is that we had to uh, take all the uh, uh, um, deleted areas out, renumber, 
and cross-reference all those renumbered documents. And attachment four is what is going to be in the district plan as uh, plan change 78, plus a new map 56A, as well as a new structure plan. The formal aspect is in terms of 161 of Schedule 1, a local authority must take uh, make the amendments to the plan uh, if it's required by the direction of the uh, Environment Court. We have got the direction and the decision of the Environment Court. And then in terms of Clause 17, which cannot be delegated to staff, Council uh, has to then approve that uh, district though that uh, plan change to become part of the uh, formal plan change and we have to identify a, uh, the, the uh, most lo likely um, uh, date of um, becoming uh, operative and we have uh, looked at the various papers they're not only all on the same day but there has to be five days between the uh, notification of the last paper and uh, calculating that it would be that the 22nd of July 2022, this particular plan change can become uh, operative. So, Dr. Chair, to, to summarise, the um, prescribed RMA process has been followed for this private plan change. The process is now concluded and you are being asked to approve the private plan change. So it is essentially a, a procedural step at the end of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Elect members, are there questions for clarification? Councillor Whitley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> yeah, look, um, Michael and Paul, thanks for your uh, summary and all the information. It's been a long journey, and no doubt about that. Now, in your, in your paper, you've got uh, clearly saying that, uh, as Paul's mentioned, that the, the target operative date is the 22nd of July 2022. And um, assuming obviously thought through the process to be notified, et cetera, et cetera, for that date to be approved. We haven't, as a, as a um, council, yet approved the uh, draft um, district plan to be going out to getting feedback from the community, but no doubt that'll be coming for the July next month's meeting, which is after the operative date that you're planning for this particular plan change. Can you confirm then that this amended new chapter on the plan change procedure will be included in that document when it goes out for public feedback. So, Chair, yeah, it's it's my reckon that it's my recommendation that we do not include this in the exposure draft. Um, what what you have in front of here is a chapter for the operative district plan that is not in the national planning standards format. Um, it will take quite a lot of time for us to actually try and convert this into the National Planning Standards um, uh, format. It, it, there's also an element of cross-referencing with the rest of the um, exposure draft, which the team would have to do. It would take some time. And in my view, um, it's, it's not necessary to put it in the exposure draft. This is, this is you know, a, a very, 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 very fresh private plan change, which is you know, just about to become operative to the operative district plan. What the team has done, however, is we have um, several references in the exposure draft, which we suggest we put in, such as special purpose zone, Mangafai Central and brackets three estates. No provisions in the exposure draft. However, the provisions will be in the notified district plan. I would just caution that we want to be not creating any perception of the community that we have um, some way uh, not been as um, transparent as we possibly would have liked in the initial uh, release of information on the new district plan. Because I think the, the, there'll be a huge amount of interest when we go out with this draft plan. And my question to you would be, uh, do you think that your wording you've suggested will be sufficient to make sure that people 
put as much attention when it is notified next year as they do when they are looking at the draft going for feedback this year, because other than it could slip through and people then get a different perception of whether we've been transparent. So, but Chair, I don't think this will slip through. Um, there's been a whole public interest in this private plan change. Um, our uh, Gillian, our communications manager, will be having a press release on this after this meeting. Um, this won't just slip through the cracks, I can tell you that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. Yes. Um, so in the report, it mentions 208 submissions plus nine. Uh, does, I've inferred, am I correct, that the 208 submissions were against and the nine were for? No. 208 were original submissions and the nine were further submissions. In other words, people who make a submission on the uh, original submissions. Thank you. And how many, uh, how many submissions were opposing the private plan change? Do you remember? It's irrelevant, really. It's the end of a process here. Oh, well, actually, that's for me to decide. Thank you, officer. Um, can you remember? You cannot. Would I be right that there were very few um, supporting? Okay, thank you. My other question is um, the section 274. In your experience as, as planners, um, how, how um, unusual is it for a council's own roading unit to, to join a, uh, an appeal as, as ours did, as the Northern Transport Alliance did? before they dropped off. Is that unusual? No, it's not unusual. <laughs> Practical example as well, uh, we are joining Dome Valley as a 274 party. So it's it's not strange uh, to become a 274 party. No, no, but our Kuiper District Council's own roading unit joined the appellants to appeal. Am I correct? Initially. They made, they made a further submission. Right. So they're entitled to uh, become a 274 party, but with the true, their aspects that they wanted were addressed in the decision. Thank you. And I'm just reading Schedule 1 of the RMA about requests for plan change. And is the usual process that that comes to the full council table for consideration? It's not delegated. Yes, it comes to the full council. It's been <laughs> and and so the council has a chance to adopt, reject, accept, or transfer to a resource consent. Correct. And so that if it had come to the council table, it would have been on a council agenda. Yes. And the public could have uh, been party to that decision. It was notified. Thank you. Councillor Larson, question for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thanks, gentlemen. I'm on page four of the report. Um, that um, how the, the appeal has been resolved and the council resolution approving plan change 78. Um, so, could you clarify for me, decision maker, we we're about to vote? But what we have here is that we have no choice other than to approve it. So, I... so through the chair, um, thank you, Councillor Arthur. The clause 17 of Schedule 1 is, is quite clear. It says a local authority shall approve private plan change once it has been no, da, 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 da. So it's not a local authority can choose to approve or has the option of approving, it's shall approve. So as I mentioned, this is the conclusion of a, of a thorough and robust process. It is essentially a procedural matter now, though. All the appeals have been resolved. It's the very, king, very end of a long and robust process. So, it's a procedural matter. Thank you, though. So, would it not then be true that this is a statutory requirement that this approval occurs and that we do not, do not actually need to proceed and vote on it because we have no option to vote against it? Because we must approve it. Shall that, approve it. Is, that is why there is one single option in the report. I know there's one option, but 
every time we vote, we can vote for or against something. In this case, we're being advised that we can only vote for it because we are required by statute to approve it. Why is it not just automatically approved by staff and incorporated into the district plan? Staff, the, have, been, staff have no delegation. The, the F, to do that. F, that is one aspect that the F does not allow to be delegated. Can you see my point though? It seems kind of ridiculous that we're voting on something and we have no choice other than to vote for it. Are there further questions for clarification? Thank you. Thank, and thank you, Councillor Larson, for that question um, regarding the procedural nature of this. Um, it is very important here. Thank you. So, uh, uh, thank you for the uh, officers for leading us through this item here today. Uh, and as we've just heard, it is a procedural matter uh, that is now before us. Um, all of the uh, work has been done by our learned friends uh, in in other forums other than this council here today. And our simple function is that our hands are tied and we shall uh, adopt this and accept this plan change at this point. So uh, the, uh, the process has been uh, well canvassed, as I say, in, in, uh, through the courts and it is uh, substantial and it is not for us at this point to relitigate or delve into the weeds on any of the aspects of that. But I would just like to commend the team uh, inside Kaipara District Council for uh, swallowing a whale with the scale of the project that this has been for Little Kaipara District Council, uh, the Mangafai Central uh, plan change and the works here uh, on a scale that Kaipara District has never seen in one fell swoop before. Uh, and uh, so I congratulate the team for uh, having navigated uh, the operations of the council through this uh, extraordinary process. Uh, so thank you. At this point, we'll go to Councillor Weathy for a statement. Thank you. Um, nothing really further for me. Thanks to the mayor. It is a procedural matter. Isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements? Councillor De La Varis Woodcock? Yes. Um, my statement is to uh, correct some uh, facts that appear uh, uh, misleadingly in the report. So, um, and I do this because I think it's important for this council to learn from its mistakes. And it's, uh, it's important for uh, me uh, to uphold principles of democracy, which is open and fair and transparent. So um, I will draw attention to one of the misleading statements in the report that says this was a robust public participatory process. Uh, it was not a robust public participatory process because on the 25th of March 2020, only three elected members of this council chose to accept the private plan change 78, uh, delegated under the auspices of a COVID emergency situation within mere days of when our council met uh, digitally online. Um, and the RMA training that I have had uh, emphasises to the point of uh, complete uh, first principles basis is that any undertaking under the RMA is upheld, you must uphold natural justice, principles of natural justice, and that is to be heard. <coughs> They are also principles of retaining an open mind and proper process. So I would like to underscore that proper process was not uh, 
upheld in this process because our full council should have had, as elected representatives of this district, opportunity to decide not just three people, three members, but the full council. And had we had that opportunity uh, and the public would have been in the gallery, at that stage, it is clear from the appeal and the Judge Smith's decision and the uh, changes from the first proposal to the judge's uh, outcome and decision, how much was uh, uh, ill-conceived in that first iteration is the word I would use. Um, so that, that is uh, something that this council must, must learn and take on board, that it made an error uh, because this council has been part of uh, a woeful saga from uh, the original Mangawhai wastewater scheme, uh, uh, poor planning. And this proposition for the biggest single development in Mangawhai and in Kaipara uh, that was evidently uh, under-supported by capacity in the wastewater scheme and by budgeting and uh, allowance for enough development contributions, but also in the original form of the proposed plan change, having sections at 350 square metres, which would have not accommodated a water tank and without any secure water supply was um, quite incredible. And I also wish for our, our council to be a trusted council. And to be a trusted council, you must spell out clearly the truth. And the truth is, in the report, it says there were 208 submissions plus a further nine. It did not say there were 208 submissions against. So I conclude this um, statement with pointing out that uh, had we on the 25th of <coughs> March 2020 had, a, had the opportunity as a full council, uh, it, we may have averted a huge effort that our community had to go to, individuals, private individuals giving up their time and their money to appeal to their court. <coughs> so the Mangawhai matters and Mr. Clive Boonham. And, um, and so, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements? <laughs> thank you. Right. Uh, there are there being no further statements, mm -hmm. and uh, again, uh, this matter being a procedural matter. Um, I, just before we do so, so Mr. Maris, regarding the vote here, um, the council's not allowed to vote against it. So you wish it be, the advice has been given by solicitors that you've got one option here? <clears throat> Clear, yeah, thank you. I'm just reiterating that. So, uh, so we will do this by division. Uh, just for the purposes of clarity at this point. So, thank you. Um, Through you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Kurnow. Four. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. Four. Councillor Larson. Four. Councillor Vincent. Councillor Worthy. Four. Councillor Wills. I have the right to abstain. Do Councillor Wills abstain? <laughs> Councillor Wilson Collins? Four. You wish? Four. You wish that's carried? Thank you. Thank you. That's carried. Plan change 78 is confirmed uh, at, at this point. And the next steps in that process regarding the public notification of this can now proceed. 
Uh, thank you, everyone who's been engaged in this process and acknowledging Mr. Boonham, who's here in the room as well. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, uh, we move on to our next item here for today, which is the Treasury Management Policy, uh, the Funding Maturity Profile Change. So uh, we have a clear recommendation here and Councillor Kerno is moving this and Councillor Weddy is seconding this. Thank you, Graham Coleman uh, is here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Yeah, um, yeah, just through the passing of time, uh, we've had a loan that's fallen into the 0 to 3 year range out of the 3 to 7 year range, which has changed our maturity profile. So, um, and in accordance with the council's treasury policy. So this recommendation is just saying that the council is comfortable with the new maturity profile that we have because of where the loans are now sitting. Um, we haven't been borrowing any money and we don't have any due for repayments. So there's not much to do about it at the moment um, for the sake of borrowing. That's happy to answer any questions so. though. Thank you, Councillor Kerner. Sorry, Graham. Just for um, the benefit of those who aren't, who don't attend the audit and risk meetings, can you just sort of explain that just a little bit more, so we fully understand why, why one we're out of policy, and two why that's okay to leave sitting there for a little while. <clears throat> the policy has some bands in terms of how our maturity for our loans should sit. We should have between fifteen percent to sixty percent of our loans sitting in the naught to three year range. Um, because one of our loans has now dropped from the three year to seven year range into the naught to three year range, it's increased the percentage of our loans sitting in the early part of the maturity profile. Okay, the only way to correct that would be to take out more loans in the latter years, which we don't need to do, or repay a loan, but we don't have any that are due for repayment. Um, so. Council's Treasury policy allows for Council to um, adopt out of policy for a while back into policy. Um, so that's what we're proposing here. It did go through the Audit and Risk Committee, and the committee were comfortable with this recommendation and did recommend it to Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there further questions, Councillor Wills? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, um, this is just a question. The schedule of interest rates that you've displayed in your presentation. I was at the audit and risk, and I think we had three sets of interest rates the underlying rate, and then we had the rate including the um, um, swap, swap, sorry. Hmm. But this is not the one including the swaps, is it? No, this is the rate on the loan. So I'm, sorry, I'm asking the council why we're displaying a set of interest rates here for the public that aren't actually what we're paying. What, interest rate we're paying because I think they're about four percent or four and a half percent. So may I ask that this is not an accurate record of the interest rate that we are paying as a council. Um, can I just clarify that? Yeah. yeah. So the interest rates that are shown here is the true interest rate on those loans. So the swaps don't tie to a loan. The swaps cover our debt. Okay. So I'm not presenting here what our interest is. I'm just showing you what the interest on these individual loans is. The swaps is a different matter. Um, the swaps were in the Treasury report, which went to the Audit and Risk Committee. Um, I just haven't included it in this report. So that and that report's available to the public. So my question, Mr. Mayor, is that, that the, because they've been included with the interest rates, that it might not be an accurate reflection. It, it is of the underlying debt, but not of what the council cost is. It is correct, but it was presented at the Audit Risk Committee. But not here in the not here to the public in the on the basis of a sorry, I'm not going to get into debate. Um, I'll talk to him with, with my statement. Thank you. Sorry, but just for clarification, though, the Audit Risk and Finance Committee is also a public meeting. Mm. Okay. So that is a presentation to the public. But it's not on, it's not recorded, Mr. Mayor. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Maris, is the Audit Risk and Finance uh, Committee meeting broadcast? Uh, through your worship, but like I'm, I'm not sure that it is. It wasn't the last uh, meeting. No, no. no, sorry, through your worship, uh, it hasn't been just because of the technology facilities in that room. But when we move into one C uh, to the new room, uh, we'll be doing what we do here with everything 
going online, noting the importance that that committee has mm. in the overall scheme. So it will be from the next meeting. But through you, uh, it is a public meeting. The public may attend and we do put the agenda online and is available online uh, as normal. Yes. yes. The Mayor, that, Thank you. That was the first Port of Numbers meeting we've held in person since the new independent chairman had been appointed. And we held it at the council chambers of the hub. That's why facilities weren't available. I presume the previous Port of Numbers meetings, which were held online, would have been screened to the public. Is that right? No? So, say the, the previous Port of Numbers meetings. Yes. They were online they because were online they were fully online. online. So, this was just this last meeting. My question, Mr. Mayor, wasn't was was about the the, the formal meetings uh, tend to be more public facing than the audit and risk meeting, and and if the interest rates hadn't been included and we were just on the terms, then I would have questioned. But just that this is where possibly the public will see the cost of our funding, so the actual funding to them. It's, 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 I'm, I'm getting almost to a statement, so I'm going to stop now. Okay, thank you, thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? Um, Sula De La Varis Woodcock. Thank you. Um, Graham, could you talk a little bit to the local government funding agency and how it may respond to increasing interest rates? Like, um, I know that it uh, has a kind of, um, it, you know, is lower than the market bank rates uh, by default because of the um, financial bond arrangements. Uh, but how... Excuse me, Councillor Delavares, that question really is outside the bounds of the subject that we're talking to here, okay, which is about the, um, the maturity, the funding maturity profile. It is indeed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just thought that, that addressing my fellow councillors' concerns about the public's understanding of this interest rate table that's set before us, how that might give them uh, answers to how the local government funding agency works in an inflationary environment. I'm not sure I'm really in a position to ask that. It's Okay. The intention is that we would invite the LGFA to a um, audit and risk committee in the future. That's what we're intending to do, and they will be able to clarify that for council at that time. Thank you. That would be most helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Councillor Kerno is the mover here. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, this, this is something that, that came to Audit and Risk and was discussed at, um, at Audit and Risk. It is not unusual for councils to sometimes be out of policy in this way. Um, and in fact, we're in a, um, one could almost say a good out of policy position in that we've um, got le um, more of our debt in short term than we imagined we would. Um, and we're not in a position to borrow more because we don't need to borrow more. So, you know, this is almost a, a consequence of our of, of <clears throat> positive effects. Um, this goes on till April 23 and it will be reviewed again then. That is uh, normal that these kinds of decisions are given a time frame so that they can be reconsidered at a future time to consider Again, is this appropriate? Um, other than that, it's a it's not quite procedural, but it is yeah, there's nothing untoward in it. It's a nor a fairly normal part of council operations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Withy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, this has already been uh, worked through at the auditors meeting, and um, I think the uh, the long-term loan uh, summary uh, that the Council has with the LGFA shows or demonstrates why we're out of um, sync now, uh, out, out, out of our zero to three year cover. It's a, it's a temporary thing which will self-correct in, in April next year, and I think it's um, not going to have any adverse effect on Council's operations. We've been totally transparent about that. 
Thank you. Are there further statements? Councillor Wills. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just briefly, yes, my first is, uh, is that, yes, the funding um, shifting out of is because of the staff's good management of our money um, and careful management. Um, it's also, unfortunately, a reflection of um, the lack of capital projects being undertaken at the moment because we're still focused on the externally funded money. Um, but that's a compliment to the staff in the way they're managing the Grand Sioux. But I just ask that one of the things I've had with this, and it's nothing to do with the swaps, is that we have the presented the gross debt and then the net debt, and then we have the underlying debt, and then we have the actual debt, the interest rates. There's so many different ways of presenting our financial information. It's the statistics and damn statistics, if I can put it that way. It would just be good for transparency that what we give to the community in any is the actual numbers as opposed to what we might use for internal funding or management processes. So that's what I'm, my statement. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements here? No further statements. Thank you. We're going to a vote on this. We just do a simple vote on this. So all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against, carried. Thank you. Thank you, Graham, for that work. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item number 5.7, the Māori freehold land rates postponement and remission policy. <laughs> item we have Christine Toms again and Shireen Mundy uh, from the policy team uh, to present this item. And I'm seeking a mover for this item. Please, Councillor Wilson Collins, thank you. And I'll second this. Thank you. Uh, Christine and Shireen, thank you. Kia ora. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> between Christine and myself, we've both have COVID. I don't, sorry, I didn't know whether I was supposed to be saying that to Christine. So, sounding a bit scratchy, but otherwise fine, thanks to my vaccination status, I think. Um, so, I'm grateful for that. Anyway, so just to briefly um, provide you an overview, um, Council approved a consultation document in April 2022. Um, with the purpose of consulting on a revised uh, Māori freehold lands and race postponement policy, rates and remission policy, sorry, to um, to give effect to the requirements of the amended legislation, which come into effect on 1st of July, so in two days' time. Um, we received no submissions on the consultation, and therefore the next step in the process is for Council to, um, so the hearings and the deliberations were cancelled and the next step for Council is to um, uh, amend the bylaw, uh, sorry, amend the policy, <laughs> apologies. Um, and that's the overview. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Witte. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, hi, Karen. Yeah, thanks for um, putting that all together. Look, in the policy, I'm going to the, the uh, policy document that you've attached to the agenda, and the, <coughs> the um, section 3, 3.1c, and you say there, there, and this is one of the reasons, because there are exceptional circumstances so that the council believes it is equitable to remit rates. Now, there's no definition of the criteria that council would use to assess whether any application meets exceptional circumstances. And I get really, really concerned when we have a policy that has something that is as open-ended as just a phrase, which is open to any individual uh, person's immediate interpretation. And I'm just wondering, are we leaving ourselves open there in this area? Sorry, through the chair, I'll probably let uh, Christine talk to the technicalities of how that would be assessed, but appreciate um, appreciate the council's comments. I too like a policy that says how things will be deal dealt with. Having said that, um, the policy does have application and criteria. It does have it does have a process that goes with it. That means that people need to explain themselves very well. And therefore the decision um, uh, to uh, apply such a situation would be based on some very detailed provision of information. So therefore you, um, the, the, the person processing the application would have to come to a conclusion based on the application and the information provided in the, um, in the application. But I'll also let uh, Christine talk to anything um, in terms of the technicalities of such exceptional circumstances. 
And, and are you confident, Shireen, that over the life of the time frame or the life of this policy, that different staff members who may be having their responsibility to assess an application against this policy would be able to have a consistent approach so that one policy, uh, you know, one application in five years' time may be treated in the same way, assessed the same way as one that would be done, uh, say, today or tomorrow. So to that, um, that comes down to how the delegations for dealing with the applications are dealt with by the CE. Um, so um, the, the, the process is that the, the authority to deal with any applications is delegated to the CE. My recommendation would be then uh, uh, for consideration that um, the internal de uh, delegations that are then authorised by the CE, that if there was to be a decision made where there are ex uh, under 31C, that that would uh, need to be authorised by the GM and or the CE in that case to uh, give uh, Council and assurance that um, the decision has been made consistent at, at a more senior level within the uh, management team. Okay, thank you. And through the chair, I just um, concur that Shireen has covered pretty much everything there. Uh, um, I don't have anything further to add apart from the fact that um, this policy was drafted with the aid of a very knowledgeable. Um, lawyer uh, who was able to help us through it and um, yeah that's all thank you thank you are there further questions for clarification just just a quick question from me uh, for confirmation so the statutory deadline by which council was required to review this policy was the 1st of july right correct so, yeah, two days from now. So we're right up against the statutory deadline on this matter. And then there is a more, we'll call it a more substantive review that will then start again, if you like, for later in the year, uh, reviewing the policy in a more larger sense, yes? Indeed. And um, at that point, we can also look further into that um, 3C and make sure that we clarify items in there for sure. Okay, thank you. So for the purposes of today's decision, if you like, is is to meet that statutory obligation about the fact that we have done a review and we have um, done that with iwi mana whenua partners uh, and, we're, and we've been absolutely transparent in that space. <clears throat> That's the purpose of today's decision. Shireen, is that correct? The purpose of today's decision is met to meet the statutory requirement to update the policy prior to 1st of July this year to make sure that it meets the new legislative framework. So thank yeah. you. And yeah. Thank you. Yep. So again, welcome to the world of yeah. Just here's another procedural matter, really. Um, all right. Uh, but uh it's important here that we've canvassed that in any case. Are there further questions for clarification? No questions. Thank you. Councillor Wilson Collins is the mover here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, this is um, simply a, um, a refresh of, of the policy as required by the government, and, and thanks to the staff for um, getting that through in the statutory time, and we'll be doing a, a larger review later. Um, so, yeah, I think we just go ahead with this one, get it done, and move on to bigger bigger things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, quick statement from me. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the work of the policy team here, uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Councillor Joyce Pucky, who is not able to be present today, uh, for making herself available to meet with uh, anyone who wanted to uh, provide input into this policy review that we've done. Uh, both she and I were available. They came through a council decision e earlier this year. Uh, and um, despite the stellar team, no one wanted to come and talk to us about this. So uh, that, from a policy re review perspective, that speaks to me of being uh, a policy that is in line with 
with what people are expecting it to be in line with. So, um, so noting that there is an additional uh, process later in the year, uh, but that for now we've absolutely met our statutory um, review process uh, to this point, so that's good, and I'm looking forward to us making a decision here. Thank you. Are there further statements? No further statements. Right, we'll put this to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against? Carried unanimously. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. At this point, uh, we will. Uh, I'd like to forge on with our final decision for today, which is the procurement policy adoption. Uh, and John Burt will be presenting this with us. Uh, and so I'm seeking someone to move this item. Oh. Councillor Webby, thank you, and a seconder here. Councillor Wills, thank you. On the table, thank you, John Burt. Kia ora. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, if I could take the report as read, I just want to uh, summarise the, um, the the report itself and the policy. The um, the matter was uh, obviously workshopped back in April with um, uh, with council at a briefing, um, and there was some um, feedback there, which has resulted in some minor changes um, to the to the policy. The policy itself um, is one that's used um, by Fongaray and also other councils. It was, it's a, um, kind of a semi-standard template for councils. We're, we're required or we're, we're um, uh, asked by audit to, to uh, review our policy, our auditors, um, and also um, reviewers. And um, yeah, so the brought back today for for adoption, but I'm happy to take any questions. Um, a couple of points that I just want to highlight before before that is um, we've also included the rescinding of the current policy manual, and the reason for that is because there is uh, quite a number of um, policy matters in that manual which um, uh, are going to be replaced by this new new policy, standalone policy itself. Um, there will be an internal process manual which will be adopted very shortly after the adoption of this policy by council. But obviously, we can't. Couldn't, I couldn't get ET to approve that prior to the adoption of the new policy. But that's that works in hand, and we expect that to happen in the next next little while. Um, the other one that was brought up in the previous uh, in the briefing was around the um, local content and measuring that. So we we have looked at that. Um, it is quite a body of work because, first of all, you've got to determine what is a local um, supplier or contractor, and then it requires quite a bit of analysis going through through claims to work out um, how much content in a particular uh, payment is to locals versus uh, a national organisation, for example. But it is something that officers will continue to, to work through. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. We'll go to Councillor Kerno, then Councillor Withy, then Councillor de la Cook. <laughs> thank you, John. Um, and thank you for explaining that you you are in the process of, of preparing an internal procurement manual and um, to align with this new policy. I'm just a little bit interested in the gap. Like how long is the gap going to be between us rescinding if we do today, the manual today in a new manual being in place, and how do we manage that gap? So what, what's well, the scale of it? The current manual, while it's called a manual, it's mostly policy matters. There's not a lot of stuff in the manual actually about procurement processing. Mm -hmm. um, and we still have all of our existing templates which can carry, carry on being used. Um, the time frame will be very short. The, the manual has been drafted and has had internal feedback, so that will go to ET very shortly um, and subject to any uh, final changes will, will be adopted, hopefully, by early next week. So. Okay. So we're really talking, hopefully, about a week. That's right. Where we're just relying on the existing templates before we might Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Withy. Thank you, Mr. Yes, John. Um, through, especially at the Audit Risk and Finance Committee, we've heard uh, repeatedly uh, the auditors um, 
criticised back to where we were with our old policy and manual. And um, I'm very pleased to see that we've taken the advantage of um, doing a little bit of uh, cooperative work with uh, Wongarai District Council to line some of our procurement policy up with, with theirs. What I'm, I'm asking is, um, has the policy uh, been put in front of our auditors to give them a chance to comment or review it? Uh, no, not specifically, but as I say, it is, it is a policy used by uh, Whangarei and at least eight other councils. So I, I imagine that it's, it's had quite a thorough review over, over a period of time because it's been something that's been knocking around for a number of years. So um, I just thought as more as a almost if we like a courtesy, they have been pretty critical of our position up until now. We've come up with something as a, a result of some of their recommendations, and I just thought perhaps it might have been mm. uh, worth considering whether or not to flick it past them before we actually put it in place. No, it hasn't hasn't been something this has done, but I I, I, I mentioned that you know in the current in the, in the upcoming order for the annual plan um, they will we please the note that we you know, hopefully do adopt a new policy today and that um, they'll have an opportunity to to, to review it um, against best practice at that time through you worship we can provide it to them um, after adoption anyway then we'll do that we'll otherwise we're only going to get next order some finance some comments yeah. from the thank you uh councillor delavaris woodrock uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, John, uh, my question is the um, proposed, we rescind this procurement manual, the proposed internally produced document uh, guiding staff procurement, will that be subject to Council's approval? No, the, the framework that which we presented back in um, April was a, a two step process. One was um, a shorter policy, which dealt with the, the matters that governance should be, um, uh, um, I guess, I guess attuned to, and then um, a more typical uh, process manual, which would be um, provided to the executive team for uh, for, for their approval. Uh, the, the process manual that we're using is again the same template that that Fongare has provided us, so it's, it's it is kind of a tried and true, tested, um, and. That's the approach that Fongaray District Council have done: is um, separate the policy matters out for governance approval versus the technical process matters, which will be done by um, the executive team. But um, so my question is: How is that transparent and open for suppliers or tenderers or any interested parties if they cannot see the technical well, process? Um, the the matters can be, for instance, uh, put up. The manual itself could be put up on councils. Um, Website. It's it's not a not a, a top secret document by any means. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Um, uh, so if we look at the procurement manual uh, on page uh, two nine four, there are nineteen acts, a list of acts that apply to the process of procurement. Whereas on the policy on page three hundred and forty three, there are only eight noted. Mm -hmm. Um, should there not be the full complement of legislative statutes that are, that affect the process of procurement noted in the policy? Uh, well, the, the acts would apply regardless of whether they're noted in the policy. I guess what we've t t taken in this uh, draft policy, which is before the Council today, is to, to have a more simplified, streamlined manual. Um, and um, I guess it, it was viewed as highlighting the most um, uh, significant ones that council, council should be adopting um, rather than an exhaustive list. Um, I mean, we, we could include um, uh, a note in the manual when, it, when it's, um, when it's finalised that, that that the list is not in the current draft policy is not not exhausted, and there are maybe other matters that that council um, well, staff need to address. We could just lift the nineteen acts if they apply to procurement, then um, then for. Some of them may be in quite minor ways, so you, you, you don't want staff to have to trawl through 19 different pieces of legislation if, if they're, you know, quite um, minor matters or are quite, are relatively irrelevant to the. Well, they wouldn't have to trawl through the legislation if they were irrelevant. You're, so are there um, questions? Yes, I do, I do have a question. 
Uh, so I have had a perusal of other councils' uh, procurement uh, policies, and um, the Napier City Council, for example, uh, uses the government's best practice procurement guidelines uh, as as a front piece for its policy, yeah. um, and not local government. So it uh, it holds. Uh, could you speak to that and why I have? Well, we, I mean, we we have referenced the the both the um, the government procurement um, framework and also the um, Auditor General's best practice. Um, and that's quite a consistent thing that councils around the country do. The thing with the, the government's framework is that some things are mandated for uh, government agencies that aren't for, for local governments. So it's, it's not appropriate to adopt it um, in whole because there are things that, um, you know, that, that the government wants their agencies to do that they don't expect local government to do, for example. Yes, quite. Um, and now, my other question is about um, the the process of assessment. So in the policy, uh, refer to page 347, and uh, one of the principles will be um, assessing suppliers or proposed suppliers for their sustainability practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just wondering, that that's a little bit, if I was a supplier and wanted to um, you know, to respond to that criteria, uh, I would be, you know, left um, perplexed as to how to do that. Is there going to be a, a questionnaire? Is yes. there, will, so, there a, you know, will that be in the... So, so in any procurement plan that you uh, create for, a, well, particularly for significant procurements, you would um, outline how you are going to assess uh, that sustainability question um, and that would be included in any um, tender documents that went out to, you know, uh, interested parties. So it would be quite clear how council will assess um, that that sustainability matter and what criteria they would use in the tender process. So remembering this, this is a policy, not the 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 detail of how we how we actually um, implement our particular procurement. Okay. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Thank you, John. Thank you. You may stand down at this point. Councillor Withy is the member here. Opening statement for you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, this has certainly been an area that has had quite a lot of discussion uh, through a number of auditors and finance committee meetings, and uh, one of the auditors that um, zeroed in on that very review time. So I'm pleased to see that we've actually uh, gone ahead and done a policy review, and it's um, it's comforting to see that we have actually taken um, note of what our um, neighbouring council has done in there, which has obviously been uh, in practice and used for quite some years, uh, quite successfully by then. So we've got a bit of commonality coming there, and we should, um, we should benefit from that over the next few years. So, really supportive of what we're doing, and hopefully, it'll Reduce the amount of time we have to listen to the auditors and some of their review of our policies. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wills has the second uh, statement from you, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just good to see progress in this regard and uh, fixing up in a hole that was there. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements? No further statements, Councillor Withy. Well, thank you. Right. Thank you. We Calling this by division. Thank you, Mr. Merritt. Three, Your Worship, Councillor Kuno. Four. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. Four. Councillor Larson. Four. Councillor Vincent. Councillor Weathy. Four. Councillor Wills. Four. Councillor Wilson Collins. Bishop. Thank you. That is carried. Uh, so the procurement policy is adopted at this point. Thank you for that. Uh, this brings us to the end of our decision-making items for today. And for this section, I'm going to call an adjournment at this point for lunch. Uh, so we will resume at 10 past one. So we've got half an hour for lunch. Everyone can stretch their legs if they choose to outside. It has stopped raining at the moment. Uh, so we'll resume at 10 past one, where we'll pick up with the information items. Thank you at 6.1. Thank you.
point one, uh, which is in our information section this afternoon, uh, 6.1, which is joint submission on the draft national adaptation plan. And Councillor de la Varis Woodcock is moving this and a seconder here. Councillor Wilson Collins, thank you. Uh, and presenting this item, we have Katie Simon, our policy advisor for climate change. Kia ora, Katie. Kia ora koutou. Apologies, I was adjusting my um, audio settings. Namahe nui kia koutou. Uh, Namahe mo te toho Māori kia koutou. Um, so, yep, this uh, report essentially presents the Joint Climate Change um, Adaptation Committee submission on the draft national adaptation plan. And I will take the report as read, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, it's, it's not really a question, is it? Because it's been submitted on June the 3rd. And... You, you can still ask questions, I guess, from a procedural perspective, you're exactly correct, right. Councillor de la Varis Woodcock. Yes. It has already been submitted. So it is, um, but you nevertheless can ask questions for clarification, but of course they can't change the procedure. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'd like to ask, I was very, um, <laughs> somewhere in there I saw that uh, one of the responses was that there should be a balanced approach to adaptation and mitigation. I thought that was really great to see that in there explicitly. And could you talk a little bit, Katie, to where where that um, position developed from? Was that part of the uh, joint meetings, or did that come from a specific council's feedback? Or Kia ora. Um, I can speak kind of broadly. I'm not sure which specific question it was in response to. Um, but yet, so, so a lot of our responses, uh, were in line with the Te Tai Tokoro climate adaptation strategy. We use that kind of as a foundation for responses along with input from, uh, elected members. There was a process to, um, receive elected member feedback as well from each of the, from each of the councils, as well as Mana Whenua input, Tongata Whenua input. So it's possible that it came from the strategy. Um, I apologize, I can't give a more direct answer, um, but it does depend on which which response. Um, but we did refer to the climate adaptation uh, strategy quite extensively um, as our kind of foundation for, for input. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that answers the question. Yes. Um, I, I guess I've got some feedback. So statements later, thank you. But uh, are there further questions for clarification? No further questions. Uh, thank you, Katie. You may stand down. Councillor de la Varis would clock statements now. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think it was a very uh, good joint effort. And I, the things that I appreciate about it is that that, you know, paying attention to this definition of vulnerability, uh, which is required uh, because Te Tai Tokoro is uh, trenchant in being a uh, community with risks of, of vulnerability and, and social economic challenges. Um, so I really, uh, you know, I, I thought that that was um, absolutely to the point to, to, to communicate to government that the risk uh, should be multiplied um, in, in terms of our region and that um, with, with Northland being susceptible to higher levels of drought and frequent uh, heavy rainfall events. Uh, on page 368, I thought it could have been mentioned for greater emphasis that local government only gets 11% of the public purse, which is pitiful if we compare ourselves to our peer countries in the OECD. So I would have put pushback stronger that the uh, sharing the financial costs of adaptation 
um, lies much more squarely at our um, central government level. Um, you know, that's just uh, beyond belief that the central government thinks that ratepayer pockets can be burdened constantly. Um, and that's that's my feedback. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, a, a big thank you and, and congratulations to Katie and all the staff and all the, the councils involved in this submission. It's it's a huge amount of work gone into this. Um, and and I'm I'm just amazed, to be honest, that so many people can put so much input into one document and you can come out with something that is cohesive. Um, having been involved with the process, though, it is a strange um, process to take in, in that you, you, you provide feedback, but so does everyone else, and, and what you end up with, um, you're not entirely sure where it's going to land, but I just think that having wrangled such a beast with so many um, with so much input and so many different elements um, is, is actually a, a congratulations to the staff involved. Well done. Glad we've got a voice in this space. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further statements? A uh, statement from me picking up exactly on what Councillor Wilson Collins has just said about Kaipara having a voice. Um, I'm uh, Delighted that page 399 is a dedicated Kuiper district specific considerations section, which uh, may have been overlooked by some of the readers of this long document. Uh, and that I am damned proud that our policy team, uh, led here by um, Katie Simon, has produced for Kuiper district specific considerations that have gone to government about the issues that most affect Kaipara district within Te Tai I, I would like to note that neither Far North District Council nor Whangarei District Council provided detailed, careful concern in the way that we have done here. Kaipara district, as we know, is significantly at risk and also has significant opportunities uh, in the climate change space and in climate adaptation, our communities are particularly vulnerable. So the, the page is 399, sorry, this is in the, in the agenda, 399 and 400, uh, Appendix A to this submission talk exactly to Kaipara's concerns within that broader frame. So I'm really, really happy that that goes forward to central government uh, so that they are under no doubt about the issues that Kaipara mm. District is facing here and what is of most importance to our community. So like I say, for those who had overlooked that, um, it's a joy and it's a blast. Uh, of course, it's a very, very grave matter regarding climate adaptation and what is proposed. We don't yet know what government's response to this very, very short review period um, is going to be. But nevertheless, Kaipara District Council is making its voice very clearly heard here. And I thank Katie Simon again for her contribution to this work, in addition to her significant contribution in the climate adaptation to Taitokoro team. Um, and I know that um, the feedback that I get as, as Kaipura's representative on that committee uh, is that uh, Kaipura is absolutely punching above its weight here. And thanks to Katie for that. So. Uh, thank you, uh, Katie, and thanks, everyone. Thank you. Are there further statements? No further statements. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock, closing statement to you. Yes, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, give a reply. Um, so, yes, the page that the Mayor refers to, the Kaipara specific uh, points that our government should be uh, attending to. Uh, are spelled out, and uh, one of the things that jumped out at me was 
reading that Kaipara has 13 of Northland's 28 closed landfills, which are vulnerable to fluvial and, and sea level rise. So um, my mind thought of the um, Fox River crisis. And so, yes, indeed, um, as, as the Mayor has pointed out, it is great to see uh, listed clearly the town of Dargaville, uh, the town is the main service centre, is exposed to mid-century flooding and coastal flooding. Uh, the Rolpo drainage network, uh, the flood, the stock banks and flood protection infrastructure that is largely borne by targeted rates. You know, this is a clear indication that we cannot sustain uh, meeting the, uh, the flood protection and land drainage without assistance from the government. And also that um, Kuiper is a strategic food basket for Auckland. And that's clear too. So well done. We'll work in this, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're putting this to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item number 6.2, the Raupo Drainage Committee elections for rate members and the process for this. And so Councillor Wills is moving this item and Councillor Kurnow is seconding this. Thank you. So, and uh, Tracy Dean, kia ora, kia ora. to present to us here on this item. Thank you. Good. Um, I was going to take the report as read, but if you have any questions, this happens every three years for this particular committee, so it's uh, a standard process. But if there's any queries, thank you, thank you, Councillor Kerno. Question. Um, sorry, I'm, you might have answered this in the report, but I might have missed it. If there are less than four candidates, what do we do then? We're required to have four by that gazetted um, right. delegate. So council can appoint or the committee can appoint. Right. So if we don't aren't put forward, then we can we have to go and find someone to fill the gaps. We're required to have the committee with a minimum of four members. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions for clarification here? Councillor Wills. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there was a, an email received from one of the existing members about mentioning current incumbents. And in a lot of organisations, there's quite often it's, it's put in there that the, this is the incumbents and these are the ones that are restanding. Just for information that goes out, I see that you've made it very clear that that's not going to be the case in this regard. Is that policy across all council? I think, um, I think I did read your reply. I just wonder, is that the standard council response? I think what we're doing is mixing up nominations with elections. So this is the nomination process. So once the nominations come in, there would be then a ballot paper or an election paper that would have details on it. And I would expect that if any of the existing members stood, that they would say they've stood for this period of time and there are statements that they're able to make when we produce that paper, which is stage two, if it goes to a vote. If we have more than six candidates. But no, other than that, we have to remain neutral, so we don't um, publish. No, I wasn't confusing them because a lot of organisations that, that I'm a shareholder and they actually come out and say that these are the directors that are standing down or whatever, and, and then they are, these ones are standing again or not yeah. at that time. But I understand what you're saying. I just thought I'd ask that that's, that's, that's just a cost blanket across all councils. So. We were required to remain neutral, but also at this stage, I don't know who's standing and standing down because nobody's nominated anyone. And so, if the current members come forward, then that's when we would mention it. We haven't yeah, been called. It become public information. Yeah. And once they put their nomination in, it becomes public record yes. by council. Through the process, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification? <clears throat> No further questions. Thank you. So we'll go to Councillor Wills. Thank you. 
for the opening statement here. I mean, it just it seems a, simple, a, a relatively straightforward process that the staff have under control. Thank you. Ah. Yes, and uh, Councillor Vincent has rejoined the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kerno is the seconder here. I have nothing to add. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any further statements here? No further statements. All right, thank you. So we're putting this item to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye against carried. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so we're moving on now to the exceptions report. Uh, and Councillor Withy would like to move the noting of the exceptions report and the seconder here, Councillor Wilson Collins. Louise. Uh, kia ora. Um, as per usual, we can take it in two parts, on the financial and the non-financial. Um, obviously, take the report as read. i uh, just like to note we've got a, a lot of green traffic lights on our first page, which is really nice to see. Anyway, happy to take any questions regarding the financial part of this report. <coughs> Councillor Talavaris Woodcock. Um, thank you, Louise. Uh, I, I refer back to the annual plan and I just see there's a slight difference in uh, the whole year forecast of rate rating revenue. So in the annual plan it's written as 44,831,000 but in the um, financials for this month the, the whole year forecast is at 41.275. This is on second page of the report. Forecast. The forecast, but, if, but in the annual plan forecast. Uh, it's the forecast of where we're going to be at the end of the year. Oh, at the end of the year. Okay. So to, to, to year, you mean as in the, up to the 1st of July? Up to the 1st of June. Yeah, 1st of June. Okay, thank you. That's... Are there further questions for clarification in the financial section, Councillor Weddy? Yeah, <laughs> you're absolutely right. I, I don't have any real concerns about the actual financial uh, summary there, but I'd just like to turn attention, um, Louise, to the capital expenditure of the period ending the 31st of May. Uh, if you look down the year to date, we've got just about, I reckon, a one, two, three, about six different line items that are very, very well shy of where we forecast them to be. If you look at um, the first column, first column on the left to the compare it to the last column on the right. Um, and with only one month, obviously, it looks as though we've got a you know snowball's chance in Hades to actually meet that. <clears throat> and then I look at further on the page or so later, and we've got the capital program with the projects completed and the projects assigned to project managers in progress, we've got a very relatively low percentage of projects that have been finished to completion. So the question is, what are we going to see at the end of June? How many of those projects that have currently in progress will have moved into the completed line and will have benefited the shortfall in the capital expenditure? So one of the team might be able to give you more details, but my expectation is you will see pretty much what you see here. It's not going to change in a month, not significantly. But I guess we've been sitting that, you know, I know it doesn't help, but um, yeah, that, that's our reality. I just thought it might have been like the- A magic wand. The normal the companies do a, a revenue surge in the last month of the financial year, we might have seen the same thing. Sadly, we're still seeing the, the projects Increasing in cost and delays, which um, yeah, is across the board, a number of our projects. Thank you. Are there further questions in the financial section? No further questions in the financial section. We'll move on to the operative section, if you like, yeah. Louise. So again, you'll see that the um, that the demand is continuing particularly for our building and resource consents teams. Um, they work exceptionally hard um, and many of them are short staffed, but they're still continuing to deliver outstanding performance. 
Um, each month we expect that that will change because of the pressure they're under and the hours they're working with, say, with so few resources. But unfortunately, um, I think it's going to happen eventually, but they continue to perform incredibly well. And demand still seems to be quite hot. We'll see that there's been a slight increase and drop around resource consent mm -hmm. in terms of days taken and um, us meeting up. But as I say, we have been thinking that's probably going to be an issue um, going forward. And in terms of customer services, again, you'll see that there's quite high demand still um, for, for us, across all of our uh, channels for our customer services. And, you, and also just to note, the commentary narrative in that section as well that Nadine's provided, because I know that was something that you'd asked for previously at the last meeting. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock and Councillor Kerno. Uh, yes, so um, the uh, you know, resource consents and, and building consents um, for the last three months have been tracking both of them slightly under prior year. Uh, levels and I want so it seems to be a little bit of a trend, but um, could you comment on that? Yeah. Uh, through you, Your Worship. So um, the re oh, the building consents are going really well still, yeah. so I'm not worried about that. Uh, the resource consents in the last month we've had four applications that didn't meet uh, statutory timeframes. Six, sorry, applications that didn't meet statutory timeframes. That was due to a backlog as one of the senior staff left. We, uh, we're convinced we've got that sorted now. Um, we, we will hopefully see a slight improvement uh, in those those figures for the next month. So hopefully we'll start reversing that trend. Okay. We're still working really hard with as we see. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kerner. That was going to be my question. The resource consents, what are we doing about it? And it sounds like you have that in hand. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions in this second part of this report? Uh, no further questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. You may stand down. Councillor Weathy, as the mover here, your statement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I think that, um, you know, on the, the conclusion of the 11th, month of the year, we're in a pretty good position financially, um, albeit that uh, we've heard over a number of months the difficulty in completing our capital expenditure program, and it's been obviously not helped by both COVID and uh, staff um, vacancies, uh, and not being able to get supply of goods. So that's unfortunately something that's a little bit out of our control. I think. Um, the other thing that is, is interesting is the level of activity within the district. And um, I think that without doubt, um, certainly um, on the eastern side, we're getting a significant amount of building activity and even resource consent is still carrying on, in spite of economic factors throughout the country, sort of suggesting that there'll be a dampening down. I'm pleased to hear the red flag that's been already talked about about processing of resource consents is being addressed. And one interesting thing that I do notice, and um, we'll see by the end of next month, or end of this month, sorry, the next next month's council meeting, what the level of building consent cumulative figure is tracking at. You'll notice on the graph that's been provided, it has actually started to track back down towards the level it was last, last um, year. And it'll be interesting to see whether it, it does continue to move slightly down from the ascending position it had up until then. This could well be associated with what um, buildings are being are being consented, whether it's uh, big large buildings or relatively small ones. Could be some factors behind it, but it's an interesting trend line because that all flows through to the economic level of economic activity throughout the district. Um, so no, I think it's all going well. For tribute to staff to carry and carry on, keeping it at, at the uh, performance levels we've seen, in spite of all the difficulties that we've had to endure during the course of the year. So, well, the rest of the thing. Thank you, thank you. 
Councillor Wilson Collins is the seconder here. Statement from you. Nothing further to add. Nothing further, thank you. Further statements from elected members here. Um, quick statement from is just to congratulate all of the team across all of the council for uh, continuing to um, provide uh, excellent results and a very clear uh, story here for all of the community about the operations of the council that are going on in the background. Um, and congratulations to the team. I uh, appreciate the change in the resource consent team and it's interesting Mr. Maris, you mentioned um, um, staff changes at a small number of key personnel and how impactful that has been just for a moment while the council readjusts. Um, those sorts of churns are, are part of kind of business continuity planning for any organisation. And it just shows, again, small Kaipara District Council and how key uh, our team members, each of our members of our staff team is um, regarding keeping um, the wheels turning and the maintaining the great levels of service for our community. So thank you to all of the team. Please pass that on, Louise, uh, from today's meeting as we are close, starting to close out the year. So thank you for that. No further statements. Back to Councillor Withy for a closing statement. No? All right. So we'll put this to the vote now on the noting of the acceptance report. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. We'll move to the resolutions register. Item number 6.4 today, and I'm seeking a mover for this item. Councillor Kerno, thank you. And a seconder here. Councillor Wilson Collins, thank you. And so, uh, Louise, resolutions register, Kia ora. It'd be easier just to take questions um, on those. Councillor Withy. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Louise, the first thing was um, on uh, what is the reference to this? Item number 5.5, .5, which is the Alma Boat Ramp and Car Park Improvements. Um, we're still waiting for the April update to be advised. I'm just wondering, because that's obviously in this neck of the woods, is a particularly <coughs> sensitive area. You know what's happening? I'm afraid, yeah, through the chair. My understanding is the uh, chaos has been delivered is has gone to connect. And um, the transport, and they're looking at the transport links, not just a car park there. Mm -hmm. So they've, got, they've been given a job to do, and um, it's, it's taking a while because they have to take a while. Yeah. Nothing's back yet. Okay, and the other question was um, the speed limit by law, which of course we've been waiting to have implemented. We heard last month that the signs were. Going up. Well, the signs have been um, uncovered now because they had covers on them for quite some time. And it's just been interesting some of the stuff that's been on Facebook. Like, um, and I'm, I'm not sure how many saying what's on Facebook. <laughs> As you drive down the street on the left time, you've got the big 40 kilometre sign on the right hand side, you've got 60 kilometres. What do you do? <laughs> and the other thing, which I think was even which is even more um, interesting, was when you come to a curve and you've got your arrows to show you how the curve, you've got four signs and three of the arrows are going that way, but the one on the middle is going, yeah, so yeah. And I was wondering, does anyone actually go around and check that all the signs are correctly put up? Now, unless someone's done some photoshopping, but I don't think they do. It's quite clear if you're traveling between the 40 and the 60, you do 50, Peter. <laughs> Uh, I'm just wondering, is there an order, Chief? Because we 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 we're relying on the people who are putting the signs up. And, um... the chair, I don't. I don't think you could have NTA. But what I would suggest is, if you've got evidence, if you submit them, I can pass them on and get them to. to yeah. I have to admit, look, it may well be that someone's just being smart and put up 
a whole lot of Photoshop stuff, but uh, they look genuine enough. Mm -hmm. If they register it on antenna, then we can pick it up through the system and then we get the actual location yeah. of it too, which makes it easier for us. <clears throat> register it on antenna. All right, it's good. Councillor Delavaris Woodcock. You, I have two queries. One is about item 11, which is the waste minimisation strategy. And it says that it, the initial budget analysis for council and procurement plan likely August, September, which is in our term, Councillor Wilson Collins. So um, I was wondering, is that optimistic, um, Chief Executive, with our staffing challenges? Or, or do you expect us, the council, to be actually be able to have a look at something like that? I think it's optimistic, but one of the team might want to give you more details. Yeah, we'll be looking at a budget that's in the works to come back. You know, we've gone through in detail about the balance in the accounts budget. I think understand that, but it's um, the funding and financing of the other part, and how is this all going to work? Because we have the presentation credit for this one. We haven't actually been able to work through the finances and how it's going to work for us. And whether, yeah, so we can come back to you. I'm not sure what we're sitting with. Okay, also, it looks like we've been with them for this council. So, uh, may I ask, has Craig been replaced? I think we're still, so at the moment, we haven't got the full time replacement, have we? Okay. okay. That's that's fine. And also, uh, the other question was on the um, business case for the Dargaville water storage, um, and it says also due of August. And I was wondering, is that optimistic, or, we, or might we see some some paper? Um, it's on item fourteen. Fourteen. Yes. Yes. I think Mike Shures has been working with Dargaville, so he's aware of it. Taking his name, right. so um, there will be something that can be because he was looking at the potential to put it into the foreign museum plan, which really has to be the new facility, especially if we get to the consultation. But, but, um, given to understand that it, it would be one of those assets that we. As, as, Seed was appropriated by the government, correct, for the proposed entities? That would be water asset, yes. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there further questions for clarification in the resolutions register? No further questions, Louise. Thank you. Standing down. So, uh, Councillor Kurnow is the mover here. Um, just as usual, this is a good report to see progress as we move through decisions made by council. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson Collins. Nothing further to add. Thank you. Are there any further statements? No further statements on the resolutions register. All right, thank you. Putting this to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Against carried. Thank you. That is now duly noted. Thank you. At this point, we move to section number seven of today's agenda, the recommendation to move into public excluded. Uh, Councillor Wilson Collins is moving this and a seconder for this being Councillor Kerno. Is there any commentary on this? No commentary. So we're putting this to the vote now. All those in favour, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. Thank you to the members of the public. Uh, we're now headed into public excluded, uh, wishing everyone a good day uh, and a good afternoon. Kia pai tō ahi ahi. And at this point... One moment, Your Worship. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry.